In this series, we're going to be going over all the cards that are currently banned in Modern. We're going over why they're banned and if they could possibly be unbanned. And in this video, we'll start off by going over some of the cards that were banned preemptively when Wizards created the format all the way back in 2011. First off, we have Glimpse of Nature. This is a sorcery that costs one green mana and has the effect where, for the rest of the turn, whenever you cast a creature spell, you draw a card. So, why is this card banned? Interestingly enough, Glimpse is currently unbanned in Legacy and Vintage, both of which are more powerful formats than Modern, and it actually sees consistent play in Legacy. This is something that will come up quite a bit in this series, where cards that are banned in Modern have a sort of template in older formats that can show us why they're strong and need to be banned. So in Legacy, Glimpse is the backbone of Legacy Elves. The plan behind Legacy Elves is to cast Glimpse, start casting Elves, and then tap the Elves using Heritage Druid, an elf that lets you tap any of your untapped Elves for mana to generate more mana. The combination of Glimpse and Heritage Druid means that as soon as you keep drawing one mana Elves, you can just keep playing more Elves and draw more cards. Heritage Druid is currently completely legal in Modern, so if Glimpse of Nature came off the ban list, Elves deck would basically morph into a worse version of the Legacy counterparts and would be able to go off and kill their opponent as early as turn 3, if they got lucky and drew their Glimpse and the Heritage drew it. So Glimpse is currently banned to keep those kinds of decks from being able to kill their opponent too early. Could Glimpse be unbanned? Probably not. Elves decks already exist in the format, and unbanning Glimpse would just make them be able to kill your opponent by turn 3. The thing is, there are already other combo decks that can win on turn 3, so Elves wouldn't be pushing the threshold there. However, it may be a lot more consistent than those other turn 3 kills, so that's also a consideration. Still, putting more and more viable turn 3 combos into the format isn't necessarily a good idea, and would probably do a lot more harm than good. So keeping it banned is definitely the safe move. How could Glimpse of Nature be fixed to be unbanned? Funnily enough, there are multiple cards with the same effect as Glimpse that are currently unbanned. Both Rite of Harmony and Beck and Call have essentially identical effects priced at 2 mana as opposed to 1, and they're perfectly fine and don't really see play anywhere because 2 mana is so much slower than 1 mana is. Though you can fix most cards by just making them cost more mana. Lightning Bolt is a great card, but Open Fire, which does the same thing for more mana, is pretty bad. So for this series, we're going to do something a little bit more interesting and try to change the effects of the card to something else to try to fix it. So, something else you can do to fix the card is to make it so you draw the cards at the end of your turn, so you can't use it to extend your plays as much. Though simply making it cost 1 extra mana is definitely the easier fix. Next up, we have the Golgari Grave Troll. This is a troll skeleton with a mana cost of 4 and 1 green, with the abilities where it enters the battlefield with a plus 1 plus 1 counter for each creature card in your graveyard, and you can pay 1 and remove a plus 1 counter from it to regenerate the grave troll, which means that the next time it would be destroyed this turn, you tap it, remove all damage from it, and remove it from combat. And finally, it has Dredge 6, which means if you would draw a card while it's in your graveyard, you can instead mill 6 and return from your graveyard to your hand. So. Why is Golgari Grave Troll banned? Funnily enough, despite being a pretty good finisher for a graveyard-focused deck, the only line of text I got this card banned was Dredge 6. You see, Dredge is already a deck in Modern, and uses a bunch of cards that also have Dredge to mill a whole bunch of cards with things like Cathartic Reunion. Then, they use cards like Necromoeba, Prize Amalgam, and Bloodgast, all of which are creatures that can bring themselves back from your graveyard to kill your opponent. Dredge is universally considered one of Wizard's biggest mistakes. The thing is, it's both really easy to pull off a big dredge that mills a ton of cards, and really hard to interact with dredge in a meaningful way. The most common forms of disruption in magic are removal, discard, and counter spells. None of these things work against dredge. They still have access to all their dredgers in the graveyard, and will still get to draw a card on their draw step, and therefore mill and make all their plays. The only way to interact with dredge is by playing graveyard hate cards, and you can't really mainboard these sorts of hate cards. So, the only way to stop Dredge from being the best deck in the format is to make sure they're slow enough that even if they're favored to win game 1, they have a hard time winning games 2 and 3 once your opponent has the graveyard hate. And this is where Golgari Grave Troll comes in. You see, Dredge 6 is the highest Dredge number in the game, so Grave Troll kind of is the best Dredge card because it puts the most amount of cards into your graveyard. Banning Grave Troll made Dredge slow enough that other decks could compete with it. Could Grave Troll be unbanned? No. In fact, Wizards actually tried that back in 2015, and it was too good, so they had to ban it again in 2017. Dredge is still a good deck in Modern, and giving the Grave Troll back could easily make them too good, especially since they have two other copies of Cathartic Reunion, the best Dredge enabler in Modern right now, due to letting you discard and draw so many cards. Unbanning Grave Troll would most certainly make Dredge decks too strong. How could Grave Troll be fixed to be unbanned? The only thing that matters on the card is its Dredge ability, so you would have to nerf that. 
You might be thinking that bumping it down to Dredge 5 like Stinkweed Imp would be fine, but Dredge decks getting another 4 copies of Imp might still make the deck too consistent, so it should probably knock down to Dredge 4 just to be safe. Keeping with the theme of good graveyard decks, let's look at Dread Return decks. This is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 2 and 2 black that allows you to return a creature from a graveyard to the battlefield. It also has flashback cost of sacrificing 3 creatures, which means you can cast it from the graveyard for its flashback cost, but you exile it afterwards. Why was Dread Return banned? If you remember what we talked about with Grave Troll and how good Dredge is, you probably remember how easy it is to mill a whole bunch of cards and to cheat free creatures out by milling cards to your graveyard. This makes Dread Return an extremely easy way to cheat out big, terrifying threats super early. In fact, it's probably the easiest way to cheat out any creature you want, if you're willing to just mill a whole bunch of cards. Could Dread Return be unbanned? Absolutely not. Dread Return is probably the least safe card to unban that's currently on the modern ban list. You see, there's this deck called Oops All Spells and Legacy that uses Balistrad Spy to mill their entire deck, cheat out free Necromebas, and then use Dread Return to win the game. In order to do this, you have to run no lands in your deck, which is pretty easy in Legacy with all the fast mana cards and the muddled dual face lands. Now, Modern doesn't have access to fast mana cards that are in Legacy, but it does have access to the model dual face lands. So the deck definitely would be viable, even if it wasn't amazing. Though what makes Dread Return so scary, outside of enabling another very strong combo deck, is the fact that it would still be really good in Dredge. Again, Dredge is great at putting a whole bunch of tiny Necromebas and Blood Gas on the field, which means it could easily make use of Dread Return alongside cards like Lotleth Giant, which has the ability where when it enters the battlefield it deals one damage to one for each creature card in your graveyard, or even just Ox of Agonus that the deck already runs to make the deck even stronger. Seeing as there are two decks that Dread Return coming back would almost certainly instantly break, it definitely needs to stay banned. How could Dread Return be fixed to be unbanned? Really, the only way to fix the card is to make it so the flashback ability costs mana. The combination of being able to cheat out a card from the graveyard while it's in your graveyard for no mana is just too strong with self-mill strategies. It makes it so the way you get the creatures to pay Dread Return's costs, the way you get the threat into the graveyard to reanimate it, and the way you find Dread Return to use it in the first place are all the exact same action, putting cards from your deck into the graveyard. Even if you make it so you have to sacrifice 6 creatures, Dredge would still probably play it to bring back a big creature that burns your opponent during their second main phase after swinging in for a ton of damage to close games. The deck already plays Conflagrate to burn your opponent out, so giving them a second card that lets them do direct damage to your opponent would just make it really, really easy for them to get turn 4 kills, on top of all the other problems with Dredge as a deck. Even doing something like making it so that you can only keep your creature for one turn, by making it so that it exiles the card at the beginning of your end step, wouldn't fix any of these issues. The only way to make Dread Return fair is to make its flashback cost at least 4 mana, which would put it in line with cards like Unburial Rites, a card which sees niche play in modern every once in a while. If you wanted to make Dread Return very powerful, but not quite broken, you could maybe make its flashback cost 3 mana on top of sacrificing 3 creatures, but that might still just be too good anyway. But again, I think saying make it cost more mana is kind of the cheater way to fix a card, so I really do think that Dread Return is just a broken card. Next up, we have Sensei's Divining Top. This is an artifact that costs 1 mana and has the abilities where you can pay 1 to look at the top 3 cards of your library, then put them back in any order. You can also tap it to draw a card and then put the top on top of your library. So, why was Sensei's Divining Top banned? First off, the card is just really good at giving you a ton of card selection and helping you find the cards you want. However, what really broke the card was combining it with cards that cared about the top card of your library. One card that was very abusable with this was Counterbalance. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 2 blue with the ability where whenever your opponent casts a spell, you can reveal the top card of your library. And if its mana value is the same as the spell they cast, you counter it. What players would do is activate Top's ability to rearrange the top 3 cards of the deck in response to counterbalance triggering. So if any of the 3 cards in your deck had the same mana value as your card, it was getting countered. This interaction was a big part of why Top saw play in Legacy in a deck called Blue White Miracles, before it was banned in the format as well in 2017. Beyond working with counterbalance, Top also worked really well with the Miracle mechanic. Now Miracle worked is that if the first card you drew that turn was a card with a Miracle, you could cast it for its Miracle cost which would be a lot less than its normal mana cost. Miracles ran cards like Terminus and Entreat the Angels alongside Sensei's Divining Top, and it was able to put them on top of their deck whenever they wanted to get that Miracle effect. Even better, because of the way Miracle is worded, it actually gets around timing restrictions. What this means is that if you drew a Terminus as the first card you drew that turn during your opponent's turn, you could cast it for its Miracle cost. 
Combining this with Top's ability to draw you a card, and you essentially have a 1 mana instant speed board wipe. Now, the power of a deck like this is certainly a big part of why Top is banned in the format. But there's actually an additional problem with the Top. You see, Top really slows down games. Because you have to activate it multiple times in a turn and constantly be thinking about what you should be doing with it, which takes a lot of thought and therefore time. On top of that, it was usually played in control decks, which are already slow, grindy decks that take a lot of time to play. This led to a problem, where back when Blue White Miracles was a big deck in Legacy, big tournaments were being slowed down by so many matches going to time in the round. In Magic tournaments, players are only given so much time to play their matches, and if they run out of time, they get a certain number of turns to complete their game before the game is considered a draw. Divining Top dragged out games to time a lot, and even once it hit time, it dragged out those games longer than usual too. This led to lots of delays in tournaments that were a huge headache for tournament organizers and staff. Additionally, more cards have come out since then that have made it even stronger. Bolas's Citadel is an artifact that costs 3 and 3 black, and has the ability where you can cast the top card of your deck by paying life equal to its mana value rather than paying its mana cost. With Diviner Top's ability to draw the top card of your deck and put itself back on top of your deck, this lets you draw through your whole library paying 1 life for top over and over. Similarly, there's a card called Mystic Forge that lets you cast the top card of your deck as long as it's an artifact or a colorless card. If you combine this with Divining Top and something to decrease the cost of your artifacts by one, you can draw through your entire deck. Currently, Top is still seen play all the way back at Vintage with Velasquez Citadel. So not only was Top just a very strong card, it also had some really undesirable effects on a game outside of just being strong. Can Sensei's Divining Top be unbanned? No. Now, while most of the cards that made Top good, specifically Counterbalance and Miracles, are legal in Modern, it is worth noting that a big part of these decks in Legacy, specifically Brainstorm, isn't legal in the format. So there is a question about if Top would be too inconsistent or slow nowadays. However, the issue with leading to games going to time and holding up tournaments hasn't gone away. And if you read Wizards' banned and restricted announcement, they make it clear that this is a big reason why the card ended up getting banned. That's not even mentioning the other uses for the card that have come out since then. Ultimately, Divining Top would likely still be too strong and cause too many issues to be unbanned. How could you fix Sensei's Divining Top so it could be unbanned? This one is a bit difficult, but I think making it so that both of its abilities were sorcery speed, meaning you could only activate them on your turn and during your main phase, while the stack is empty, would make it worse enough that it could be unbanned. One hidden strength of Diviner Top that I didn't explicitly mention yet is how hard the card is to remove. If your opponent tries to kill it with a removal spell, you could always simply use its ability in response to hide it on top of your deck. This made the countertop combo very hard to disrupt on top of everything else. So making both the ability and the ability to rearrange the top cards of your deck sorcery would fix most of the issues with the card, as players couldn't use its ability to stack their deck on their opponent's turn anymore. Though it would still maybe be too good with cards like Bolas's Citadel, so to be extra safe you might need to have it enter tapped or something. Honestly, the fact that I feel the need to nerf it that hard to make it safe shows just how strong the card is, which is ultimately the point of this exercise. And the last card we'll be covering in today's video is Hypergenesis. This is a sorcery with no mana cost, meaning it can't be cast normally. It does, however, have a suspend 3 for 1 and 2 green, meaning you can pay 1 and 2 green to exile it with 3 time counters on it. Then on each of your upkeeps you remove a time counter from it, and when you remove the last one you can cast it without paying its mana cost. When it does resolve, it has the effect where, starting with you, each player may put out a land, creature, artifact, or enchantment card from their hand to the battlefield, and then you repeat this process until someone doesn't put a permanent onto the battlefield. Hypergenesis is part of a cycle where they took old, classic cards with really strong effects and nerfed them by making suspended-only versions of them. Hypergenesis is a suspend-only version of Eureka, which, as you can see here, has the exact same effect. Both of these cards don't care about what you put onto the battlefield, so you can put huge threats into play for very little mana with them, and your opponent likely won't have anything near as good to cheat in. Why is Hypergenesis banned? On its own, Hypergenesis wouldn't be that big of a problem. The issue is all the ways you can cast Hypergenesis early. You see, there are a few cards that happen to synergize very well with suspend-only cards, specifically Cascade. Cascade is a keyword where, whenever you cast a spell with Cascade, you exile cards to the top of your deck until you exile a card that costs less. Then, you cast that card without paying its mana cost, and put all the rest of them on the bottom of your deck. What this means is that if you hit a suspend-only card with Cascade, you can cast it right away. Even better, if you run no cards that cost less than your Cascade spells, which means no cards that cost 3 or less, you can always hit your Cascade-only cards. This interaction is the backbone of two decks in Modern already. Living End and Crashing Footfalls. 
Living in basically swaps all creatures in the battlefield with creatures in the graveyard, and Crashing Footfalls makes you two 4-4 green rhino creature tokens with Trample. These decks are both really strong, but Hypergenesis has a few things that would make it more dangerous than these decks. Living End needs creatures in your graveyard to work, so it has to run a bunch of creatures with cycling, so that they can have creatures in the graveyard to reanimate. This means that Living End decks can put up very threatening boards, but they can't afford to run very many good cards in their deck. Crashing Footfalls can get away with playing a bunch of cards that are actually pretty decent, like Prismari Command and Brazen Borrower, but its payoff is just two 4 4 Tramplers, which is good, but not unbeatable. Hypergenesis has the best part of both of these cards. You can run a whole bunch of good cards in your deck like Footfall's decks can, but instead of simply making two 4-4s, four you'll be cheating out Urmkuls and Grizzlebrands. This would basically make the deck a better version of Footfall's deck that could win way faster. Could Hypergenesis be unbanned? Probably not, but the reason here is actually kind of interesting. You see, more so than just being too good for the format, unbanning Hypergenesis would basically outmode two already popular and unique decks. Living End and Crashing Footfalls, and making one deck that's just better than both of them. Now, there are some downsides to Hypergenesis over these decks, namely that you need the cards you want to cheat out in your hand, but the threats are so much better, and there are enough viable cards to boost consistency, that Hypergenesis would almost certainly end up being the stronger deck. So, unbanned Hypergenesis would do nothing but make two different, unique decks unplayable, and add nothing to the metagame, so it's much better for it to simply remain banned. How could Hypergenesis be fixed to be unbanned? This is the hardest one to fix so far. You see, the idea behind Hypergenesis is simple. Be a suspend-only version of Eureka. However, this inherently leads to all the problems we've talked about so far. The number of turns you have to wait for the suspend ability and the cost of the suspend ability don't matter because you're never casting it that way. However, changing anything else about the card kind of ruins the design. If you give it a mana cost, it no longer is part of the suspend-only cycle, and if you change its effect, it's not a copy of Eureka anymore. Really, there's just no way to fix this card without changing the fundamental design of the card. First up, we have Mental Misstep. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 Phyrexian Blue, which means you can cast it by paying a blue mana or paying 2 life, meaning you could cast it for 0 mana by paying the life, and it has the effect where it counters target spell with a mana cost of 1 exactly. Mental Misstep is another one of those cards that was banned at the inception of the format all the way back in 2011, and no one's even considered ever taking it off the list. So, why is this card banned? Zero mana counterspells have a history of being really strong. Mental Misstep is no exception. Now, spells that cost exactly one are a very rare set of cards, and some people may doubt that it's that important. The thing is, almost every deck plays one mana spells. You see, because one mana spells are the only cards you can play on turn one, and they're some of the cheapest cards in the game, they tend to be really important and generally pretty strong for their mana cost. Cards like Lightning Bolt, Thought Seize, and Path to Exile are some of the strongest pieces of interactions in their colors. Modern has tons of good one-mana threats, like Ragavan and Death's Shadow. Lots of fast combo decks rely on one-mana spells to make their plays, like Scale Up in Infect, or Colossus Hammer in Hammer Time. Lots of decks will play mana dorks like Noble Hierarch to get extra mana. These are just a few of the examples I could use. Efficiency is one of the most important things in Magic, as having an impact on the game as soon as possible becomes more and more important the faster a format gets. Additionally, this also lets you be more flexible in your turns, as if you have a bunch of 1-mana spells in your hand and 2 or 3 mana, you can cast any combination of your 1-mana cards. So, the combination of how inherently good cheap 1-mana cards are, alongside the fact that they're just a bunch of really good 1-mana spells, means that Mental Misstep has a ton of targets in every game. Misstep is a huge tempo play. Stopping your opponent's removal spell without spending any mana is way better than it sounds like it is. One of the things people learn about magic very quickly is to watch how much mana your opponent has available. If all their lands are tapped, you can cast whatever you want without worry. However, zero mana spells change that. You can think you're free to do whatever you want, and then your opponent can blindside you with a misstep. Magic is built around playing around your opponent, spending their mana to such a degree that a card like misstep, that can counter a huge number of plays at any time, and for such a small cost of two life, is actually kind of format warping. Not to mention that having it also means you can use it on your opponent's first turn whereas the first plays are usually completely safe. Pretty much every deck would be playing Misstep. The thing that made this even worse is that the best answer for Misstep is another Misstep. Misstep is technically a 1-mana spell, so it's a valid target for another Misstep. This would make it go from a super staple into a mandatory Fora for every deck. Even if you aren't interested in countering your opponent's plays, the best way to make your own plays go through was playing it. Misstep being legal would lead to a ton of games where the winner was based on whoever drew the most Missteps which obviously warrants a ban. 
Can misstep be unbanned? No, absolutely not. Misstep is probably the strongest card we'll talk about in this whole video. Modern is even more dependent on one mana cards now than it was in the past, so misstep's influence on the format would only be greater. How could misstep be fixed to be unbanned? The card really needs to have some kind of bigger cost. The card was probably imagined as being usable on only a pretty narrow subsection of cards, but as we've said, it actually counters a huge number of very, very important cards. Two life just isn't a real cost most of the time. The simplest solution is adding a one mana to the cost, which would actually do a lot to fix the card. Not only would it make it no longer a zero mana play, it would also make it so that misstep wasn't a target for itself anymore, which would go a long way to making it fair. And at that point, it would still be really good, but it would at least be unbannable. Next up, we have Blazing Shoal. This is an arcane instant, arcane basically being its own mini archetype that doesn't usually come up, with a mana cost of X, meaning any amount of mana and two red. It has the effect where you can exile a red card from your hand without paying its mana cost, and if you do, the X and its cost is equal to the exile card's mana value. Then it gives a creature plus X plus zero until the end of the turn. This card is a member of the cycle of shoals that all have a similar ability, where they can each exile a card of their color from their hand and set the cost of X to the mana value of the card you exiled. Blazing Shoal was banned in September 2011, a month after the format came into existence, meaning it's been on the ban list for a long time. Why is Blazing Shoal banned? Blazing Shoal was banned due to the way it interacts with the mechanic called Infect. We mentioned this briefly earlier, but how Infect works is it makes anything with Infect deal damage to creatures in the form of minus one minus one counters, and players in the form of poison counters. And if you ever have 10 poison counters, you lose the game. Basically, if you're playing an Infect deck, your opponent starts the game at 10 life instead of 20. This has led to Infect decks being prominent and pretty strong for a long time. And their main strategy is playing cheap Infect creatures and pumping them with pump spells. Blazing Shell was great in this deck, as it gave them a turn 2 kill. If you played a 1 mana Infect creature on turn 1, and then cast a Blazing Shell on it by exiling a 10 mana red card. It wouldn't normally be possible to get a turn 2 kill with Shoal because Wizards usually doesn't print cards that cost more than around 10 mana at the most. In fact, puts Blazing Shoal into lethal range by basically dealing a free 10 damage to your opponent at the start of the game. So, Wizards ban the card to stop Infect from having a way to kill your opponent on turn 2. Could Blazing Shoal be unbanned? Yes, actually. See, the thing is that Blazing Shoal was banned to stop Infect from having a turn 2 kill. However, Modern has gotten a lot faster the decade, and not only are there other decks that can pull off a turn 2 kill, such as Hammer Time, but in fact can actually pull off some of their turn 2 kills anyway. You see, Scale Up, released in Modern Horizons 1, is a 1 mana sorcery that makes a creature 6 5 until the end of the turn. If you combine that with cards like Mind of the Old Crosa or Mutagenic Growth, you can actually reach 10 in fact on turn 2 without Blazing Shell, so having Blazing Shell on ban wouldn't break any barriers. It's also debatable about whether or not Infect would even play Blazing Shell nowadays, mostly because of needing to play red cards to work with it. Playing massive, uncastable cards in your Infect deck really feels bad, so most Infect decks probably wouldn't even bother. The card they thought would play alongside their Shell, if anything, would be Fury, another card you can cast for free by exiling a card from your hand, which costs 5. This would let them hit some important thresholds for turn 2 kills, but would also let them have another card in their deck that could actually do something. Now, this would maybe be better than Infect decks are right now, but that's kind of a toss-up without extensive testing. Modern day Infect decks are so consistent and have so many good pump spells to play that they don't even play the cantrips that they use to find their important pieces. So, if there's no reason to keep Blazing Shell banned, why is it still on the ban list? Well, Wizards doesn't ban cards just because they could be fared now. They usually only make changes to a format when they feel it would actively make the format better. It's sort of a better safe than sorry approach. Since banning Blazing Shell wouldn't make things better, and it's still possible for it to make things worse, why not simply keep it banned? It's certainly the safer option. How can Blazing Shell be fixed to be unbanned? As I said, it could probably unban with no problem right now, so it doesn't really need fixing. Next up we have Gitaxian Probe. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 1 for Axian Blue, with the effect where you look at your opponent's hand and then draw a card. This card was banned in January 9th of 2017. So why was Gitaxian Probe banned? To put it simply, it did way too much for way too little. Because Probe didn't cost any mana and drew you a card, you didn't lose anything to cast it. Sure, if you're playing against a burn, the two life might matter, but in other matchups it usually didn't. Not only was Probe pretty much free, but its effect was surprisingly good. Getting to know your opponent's hand is really important for combo decks that need to put a lot of resources into pulling off their combos. Decks like Infect and Storm both love Probe as a way to check your opponent's hand for interaction. 
Now, the ability to know what interaction your opponent does and doesn't have is actually way stronger than it sounds at first, because the game is balanced around players usually not knowing what your opponents are holding up. A huge part of Magic is having to guess what cards your opponents have based on what mana they're holding up and how they've been playing. And the ability for your opponents to bluff or sandbag interaction is a big part of playing against these sorts of combo decks. If your opponent can check your hand right before trying to do their combo, they can know exactly how to sequence their plays to play around it, or know if they should hold off or try to combo later. This is extremely good, but that alone isn't enough to get the card banned. You see, there's actually a card called Peak that does the same thing as Pro, but costs a blue mana instead of Phyrexian blue mana. Peak is an alright card that sees some competitive play for all the same reasons that Probe did, but it was never as good because it actually cost you mana. The thing that made Probe broken was the combination of doing all that without costing anything at all. Probe lets you play around interaction and actually made your deck more consistent by cycling itself with no cost, which is why it made these sort of all-in combo decks way too strong and hard to play against. Can Gitaxian Pro be unbanned? This is another hard no. Not only have the combo decks that Gitaxian Pro was good and not gone away, they've actually gotten better and there are even more of them. Infect has more pump spells than ever, Storm is still running around, worst of all, one of the best decks in the format right now is Hammer Time, a combo deck that would love to have a free cycle and the ability to check your opponent's hand. Giving one of the best decks in the format access to Gitaxian Probe would only hurt the format. How can Gitaxian Probe be fixed to be unbanned? In a way, this has already happened. Peak is nearly identical to Probe, and it's fine. If you want to fix it in a way that would make it different, something like making it so that you draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep, would make it worse enough that it could come back without issue. Next up, we have Mox Opal. This is a legendary artifact that costs zero mana and has the ability where you can tap it to add one mana of any color as long as you control three artifacts, which does count itself. This card is a callback to the Moxen, which were cards printed in the very first set of Magic that turned out to be way too good. So it's kind of no wonder that Mox Opal ended up finding itself banned eventually. Mox Opal was banned in January 13th of 2020, making it one of the more recent bans in this video. So, why was Mox Opal banned? The issue was that getting three artifacts was actually pretty easy. Not only were there lots of zero and one man artifacts, there were lots of good ones that you were more than happy to play. Decks like Hammer Time and Affinity were chock full of great, cheap artifacts that could turn the card on by turn two. Affinity is great at storming the board with cards like Memnite, and Esper Cenadil to synergize with artifact payoffs like Thought Monitor and Urza, Lord High Artificer. With all these great artifact cards and artifact payoffs, they didn't really need to play any cards that they didn't want to play anyway. It's not like they were making the rest of their deck worse to play Mox Opal or anything, so in these decks, Opal was usually just a normal Mox with a very small restriction. Okay, so then why are the Moxes too good? Moxes are what the community calls passive mana, which means that they generate more mana than it costs to play them. Not only that, but they cost zero mana, which means that you don't even have to put any investment into them to get anything out. What this means is that Moxes are able to help you accelerate all of your plays, they're extremely flexible, and they're easy to get on board. Rituals are often held back by the initial mana investment, which makes them more awkward to use, as they can mess with things like the color requirements of your cards. A Mox is basically a better and easier to use ritual in every way. Not only that, but they generate mana for you every single turn, kind of like Rampant Growth would. The thing is, Rituals and Ramp Spells are both pretty good, and there are decks in Modern that play these kinds of cards to great effect. Moxes are better Rituals and better Ramp Spells, all in one. This isn't even getting into the infinite mana combos you can pull off of them, but that's something we should probably save when we talk about Quark Clan Ironworks. Now, I haven't really been talking about specific decks or interactions that Mox Opal was busted with, but that's because there are just too many to list. If I tried, we'd be here all day. It's been played in decks like Affinity for years and saw play alongside decks like Wurza, named after Wur of Invention and Urza. And this is the deck that eventually led to the card getting banned. Of course, this is only scratching the surface of where Opal has been played. Mox Opal was allowed in the format for years, but it was always kind of on a short leash. And a lot of players would probably argue that it should have been banned sooner. It's been in a ton of problematic decks and a key part of making them work, so it's kind of a wonder how it was allowed in the format for so long anyway. Could Mox Opal be unbanned? Another big no. The cards that Mox Opal were good with are still in the format, and they've only gotten better. Mox Opal would be a great include in Hammer Time, a new deck that it wasn't around long enough to see play in, but the card that really seals the deal is Urza's Saga. Saga was released in Modern Horizons 2, which was released in the summer of 2021, so about a year and a half after Opal's banning. Saga is an enchantment land, and it's a saga, meaning that whenever it enters the battlefield or at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you put a lore counter on it, then you trigger the corresponding ability. Then if you just triggered the last ability, you have to sacrifice Urza's Saga. The important ability here is the last one, 
which lets you search your deck for an artifact with a mana cost of exactly 0 or 1 mana and put it into the battlefield. This would be amazing with Mox Opal, which is why people play the cards together all the time in Legacy, and why Opal will never be unbanned in Modern as long as Saga is around. How can Mox Opal be fixed to be unbanned? This is another card that's really hard to fix without fundamentally changing the design. The card started with two ideas, be a Mox and use Metalcraft, which was a set mechanic that did things if you had at least three artifacts. These two things created a card that was just too good. If you increase the cost, it's not a Mox. If you had more restrictions, it's not really a Metalcraft card. The best answer I have without changing the design is to make it enter the battlefield tapped, but that probably won't do enough. This one's hard to fix without scrapping the design entirely, so I wonder if anyone in the comments can come up with a better restriction that still keeps the same fundamental design. And the final card in this video will be Once Upon a Time. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 and 1 green, and if it's the first spell you cast this game, you can cast it without paying its mana cost. It has the effect where you can look at the top 5 cards of your library, reveal a creature or land from among them and put it into your hand, and then put the rest of them on the bottom of your deck in any random order. This card was banned in March 9th of 2020, meaning it was the most recent banned card in this video. So why was Once Upon a Time banned? This one is kind of weird. The card isn't banned because it makes anyone's strategy too good, Rather, it was just a staple that was kind of a no-brainer for a lot of decks. There are a lot of combo and mid-range decks that play a ton of creatures, and of course have lands that they like to grab. Decks like Infect, Amulet, Titan, and Boggles all like it for its ability to find key creatures for them on their first turn of the game. This made these decks a lot more consistent and made them able to enable their gameplays way easier. Once Upon a Time is pretty easy to cast on turn 1 for free, but it's perfectly fine to just pay 2 mana for in the decks that want to run it too. So. For the upside of getting a huge consistency boost on the first turn of a lot of games, you didn't really have to give up anything. Now, this is obviously really good, but why does a simple boost to consistency of decks warrant a ban? There are a couple of major points. First off, Wizards really doesn't like it when cards become too homogenized in a format. The fact that most of the decks in Modern were playing this card, even if it wasn't a major part of the game plan, just rubbed them the wrong way. The second issue was how the consistency boosting cards make it very difficult to find counterplay for these decks. A lot of the time, trying to make your opponent have to top deck a piece of their combo can buy you the one turn you need to win. This is why interaction for combo decks is so important in these meta games. However, the more consistent these decks can find their combo pieces, the harder it is to fight through and slow them down, or to try and kill them before they can combo off. Another issue is the way that this high consistency tends to favor top tier decks over other decks disproportionately. You see, the reason these decks are top tier is because they're the fastest and most consistent combos in the format making everything more consistent favors them over other decks because their combos are stronger and easier to assemble already. So Once Upon a Time doesn't really break anything, it just makes already good decks even better and widens the gap between the best decks and everything else even more. Can Once Upon a Time be unbanned? This is also a no. Unbanning the card would have a negative impact on the format overall, as all the problems with the card haven't gone away. However, unbanning it wouldn't necessarily break anything in an obvious way. Once Upon a Time is kind of a silent killer. It doesn't look like the problem card in any deck, but it makes the metagame centralized around all the already strongest strategies, so unbanning it would definitely be a bad idea, but it wouldn't be as catastrophic as some of the other cards on this list. How can Once Upon a Time be fixed to be unbanned? I would say make the first spell you cast this game mode cost 1 mana instead of 0. That would make the card still be good, but a lot of decks would be less interested in playing it because they have their other turn 1 plays they really want to do. It would essentially make Once Upon a Time have an actual deck building cost whereas right now it was kind of a free roll. First up, we have Chrome Mox. This is an artifact with a mana cost of zero and the ability is where, when it enters the battlefield, you exile a non-artifact, non-land card from your hand. Then you can tap it to add one mana of the exiled card's color. Why is Chrome Mox banned? Last video, we talked a little bit about what makes these kinds of colors so good when we talked about Mox Opal. To summarize, Moxen are kind of like lands that don't take up your land drop. Getting mana is important for literally every deck. So getting more mana is always good. This extra mana can allow you to accelerate your game plan far faster than you normally could. Magic has lots of strong stacks pieces that can make it essentially impossible for your opponent to play the game if you get them down early enough. It also has tons of combo decks that win the game on the spot if you get all the pieces down at the same time. Moxen, like Chrome Mox, can help get these cards out as early as the first turn of the game, leading to very early wins. Even better, unlike other cards that add mana, like Rituals, Moxen stays around and keeps making mana every turn, making them even stronger. So Moxen in general are kind of busted, but it's worth mentioning that Chrome Mox is even better than Mox Opal, staying on the ban list ever since the format was initially created, while Mox Opal was legal in the format for a while. So why is Chrome Mox so much better than Mox Opal? The answer is that it's just a lot easier to use. 
It does require to go minus one to play it, but the card doesn't ask you to make any real sacrifices in deck building. While Mox Opal is extremely powerful, it does require you to be played in Artifact deck, which severely limits the kinds of decks that it can be played in. The minus one just can't compare to the Temple Swing playing Chromox gives you, especially since it can help you power up powerful draw spells. Chromox could slot into just about any combo deck of the format, it would make combo decks even more dominant than they would normally be. Could Chromox be unbanned? Absolutely not. The combo decks in the format have just been getting stronger over time, and Chromox would make them even faster and more consistent. Unbanning Chromox would make combo decks way too good in modern compared to other decks in the metagame. It's worth mentioning that this card isn't banned in Legacy, which is a much stronger format than modern, and in Legacy it helps facilitate a few first turn kills, or FTKs. Wizards doesn't really allow first turn kills to stick around in modern, unless they're very janky and inconsistent, because the format doesn't have enough zero man interactions like Force of Will to keep those decks in check. There are a few FTKs that would not only be possible in modern, but could be fairly strong if Chromox was around. One deck that's been flowing around for a while is Goblin Charbelcher. This is a 4 mana artifact that lets you pay 3 and tap it to reveal cards on top of your deck until you reveal a land, and deal that much damage to any target, including your opponent. If you can get the 7 mana to cast and activate this card without running any lands, you can kill your opponent on turn 1. Charbelter is already a deck in modern, and you can pull off turn 2 kills right now. With Chromox, the deck would be able to pull it off on turn 1, and it would get faster across the board. And remember, this is just one example of a possible FTK deck. Chromox getting unbanned would enable way too many broken combos to be unbanned. So, how could Chromox be fixed to be unbanned? This one is really hard. There's really nothing you can do to fix the card other than just making it cost more mana. Making players exile two cards from their hand or making it into the battlefield tap wouldn't go far enough. Players would still use it to set up extremely fast combo plays. The closest thing to fixed Mox in the game is Mox Amber, which requires you to control legendary creature or planeswalker to be able to activate it. You could give it a similar restriction, but having that on top of exiling a card from your hand would feel very strange from a card design perspective. Moxes are just really unbalanced cards, and need very hard restrictions to not be broken. Going minus one proved to not be nearly enough to make it fair. Next up, we have Artifact Lands, namely Ancient Den, Seat of the Snod, Vault of Whispers, Great Furnace, and Tree of Tales. These are a cycle of five lands that each tap for one of the five colors of magic, and are artifacts as well as being lands. This doesn't affect how they play at all, it just means they're vulnerable to artifact removal and count for artifact synergies. Why are the artifact lands banned? Well, remember when I said that having artifact type meant that they had synergies? Well, those synergies are really strong. You see, there's this deck in Modern called Affinity, which runs a bunch of cards that care about you having artifacts. The deck is named after the Affinity for Artifacts Mechanic, which made spells cost one less for each artifact you control. They also ran cards like Nettlesyst and Arcbound Ravager. Nettlesyst is basically a creature that gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control, and Arcbound Ravager is a two mana creature with modular one. Meaning it enters the battlefield with plus one plus one counters on it, when it dies you move all those plus one plus one counters over to another artifact creature, and it has the ability where you can sacrifice an artifact to put a plus one plus one counter on it. So, these decks were able to push out a lot of damage really quickly, and their strength was based on how quickly they could put artifacts into the battlefield. So, the artifact lands were really strong because they basically let you put an extra artifact into the board every turn. This made affinity decks so strong in their respective standard format that the cards were preemptively banned when the format was first created, and they've stayed on the ban list ever since. Could the artifact lands be unbanned? This one is a weird one, because the right question is actually how many artifact lands could be unbanned. To answer this question, we look at the cards like Darksteel Citadel and Razor Tide Bridge. Citadel is an artifact land with Indestructible that you can tap for colorless. This card is a constant inclusion in Affinity Decks for all the reasons we've talked about, but only having access to four copies has stopped it from being too strong. There's also Bridge, which can be tapped for white or blue, also has Indestructible and enters the battlefield tapped. This card is a member of a cycle of bridges that all have the same abilities, but tap for different colors of mana. Lands that have to enter the battlefield tapped are usually too weak to see any competitive play, but these cards have still managed to see play in Affinity decks because being an artifact is just that good. So, looking over these cards, we can tell that artifact lands are very strong, but not strong enough that letting Affinity decks have access to some of them would instantly break the deck. So we could unban some of the artifact lands, but unbanning all of them would make the deck far too strong. The thing is, Wizards is very unlikely to do this. Having some cards in the ban list that are virtually identical to cards off the ban list is just kind of strange. There are other cards similar to the artifact lands that are unbanned, but they have distinct differences. Having cards that the only difference between them is what color mana they tap for being unbanned while other identical cards are banned is kind of a thing that Wizards wants to avoid. They might still do it if they wanted to help out Infinity, but Wizards has shown to be more than willing to print more great Affinity cards like Thought Monitor, 
So if they wanted to help Affinity, they would probably just print more good Affinity cards rather than do some awkward unbanning. So to put it succinctly, the artifact lands can be unbanned, but not all at once, and that means they're very unlikely to ever actually be unbanned. How could artifact lands be fixed to be unbanned? They could currently be unbanned with no problem, as long as not all of them get unbanned. If we wanted to fix them so they could be unbanned all at once, they would need some kind of downside, like entering the battlefield tapped. Though, making them enter tapped would make them strictly worse than bridges, so some other downsides would probably be better. Though, I can't think of anything that would really work. Maybe making tapping them for mana cost 3 life would make them risky enough to use that the cards would still be useful but not busted, as it would make the deck very weak to other aggro decks. Next up, we have Umazawa's Jite. This is an artifact equipment with a mana cost of 2 and an equip cost of 2. It has the abilities where, whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage, you put two charge counters on the Jite. You can remove a charge counter to do one of three things. Give target creature minus one minus one, give the equipped creature plus two plus two, or gain two life. Why was Umazawa's Jite banned? Jite was a menace back in its standard format and has seen playing Legacy alongside Stoneforge Mystic for years. It's a bit hard to put into words just how much control over a board a Jite can have. Once a creature with a GTA on it gets into the red zone even once, combat will basically never go your way again. Playing any creature with two or less toughness is out of the question. They can remove both counters to give the creature plus four plus four, meaning even relatively big creatures like Tarmogoyf will lose in combat to the creature. You can't really race them either, as the ability to remove counters to gain life means they can pad their life total really easily. All of these abilities combined kind of just takes creature combat out of the game for whoever who doesn't have a GTA. What ends up happening is that once the GTA has counters on it, the creature will start swinging in and getting more and more counters on the GTA. You can't block because they can just pump it to response to win combat. You can't try to kill them first because it will just gain too much life, but you have to do something because they can start removing counters to kill all your creatures. Once a GTA gets counters, you've basically lost every combat step for the rest of the game until you find a removal spell for the creature or the GTA itself. Now, this isn't that big of a deal. Decks play removal for these kinds of cards, if not in the main board, in the sideboard, and creature combat isn't the main focus of the game almost in any format sense limited. However, GTA basically removes combat as an option for your opponent. Playing more creatures is often a valid strategy against an opponent trying to aggro you down, but GTA removes that dimension of the game. Being able to just win combat forever because you paid 4 mana for an equipment is too good against certain decks. So, could GTA be unbanned? Realistically, yes, but unbanning GTA would have some pretty bad consequences for the format, so ultimately it shouldn't be unbanned. To explain what I mean, we should talk about Modern as a format. Modern, like all non-rotating formats, gets faster and faster as more cards come out and more synergies are discovered. What tends to happen is that decks sort of coalesce around the best combo decks, and the rest of the format responds to those decks by playing the interaction and threats that happen to be good against them. As the power level rises, certain strategies that are considered a big part of the game slowly get power crept out of relevance. One of those strategies is good old creature-based aggro decks. The aggro decks that are good in modern nowadays are basically combo decks, like Infect, Dredge, and Affinity which rely off of very synergistic cards to put out way more damage than simply casting threats can. The only straightforward aggro deck that's really still viable is Burn, and that's not exactly a creature-based deck. The strategy of playing out efficient beaters and attacking has become tier 2 at best, with decks like Merfolk and Spirits being some of the only decks that have any real success in the format in quite some time who could be fairly called a creature-based aggro deck. GTA is extremely good against these kinds of creature-based aggro decks, and good against other kinds of aggro decks like Burn. Unbanning GTA wouldn't really do anything to disrupt the rest of the modern metagame. It would be a good card against certain matchups, but it wouldn't break the format. The only thing it would really do is make decks like Merfolk kind of unplayable in Stoneforge decks. So realistically, unbanning GTA wouldn't break the format, it would be just the final nail in the coffin for tier 2 decks and make modern a format where combat focused decks aren't good enough anymore. So GTA could probably unban without really doing too much damage, but when the only thing you gain from unbanning a card is making some people's pet decks worse, it makes more sense to leave the card banned. How could GTA be fixed to be unbanned? If you had to deal combat damage to a player to get the counters, that would be much worse and would definitely be safe enough to unban the card. It would give creature decks way more play against the cards as they could simply chump block the creature with the GTA on it and would make it so that playing a creature into a GTA didn't pretty much always feel like a losing battle. Even better, this fix still leaves the card relatively powerful as the GTA's abilities are all still really good and do have the potential to snowball the game. The card would still see play, it just gives the opponent some counterplay outside of drawing removal. Next up on this list, we have Skull Clamp, another great equipment that has never been legal in Modern. This is an equipment with a mana cost of 1 and an equip cost of 1 with the abilities where the equipped creature gets plus 1 minus 1 
And whenever equipped creature dies, you draw two cards. Why is Skull Clamp banned? Skull Clamp is really, really good at drawing you cards if you build your deck around it at all. Because Skull Clamp gives the equipped creature minus one toughness, all you have to do to draw two cards is attach it to a one toughness creature. Not only is it easy to get one toughness creatures, it's easy to get multiple one toughness creatures. There are tons of cards that give you lots of small 1-1 one -one creature tokens. Lots of these cards are also really strong. The most infamous example of cards that let you draw a ton of cards of the clamp are Young and Seasoned Pyromancer. Young Pyromancer is a 2-1 for 1 and 1 red with the ability where whenever you cast an instant or sorcery you create a 1-1 one -one red elemental creature token. This card was already really strong on its own to the point where people not too long ago were building decks around its ability to make a huge number of creatures alongside cards like Lingering Souls. A card that makes two 1-1 one -one white spirit creature tokens with flying that you can flash back for just 2 mana and would also be really good with clamp. Seasoned Pyromancer is a 2-2 with the ability where, when it enters a battlefield, you discard two cards and then draw two cards. Then for each non-land card you discard, you make a 1-1 red elemental. You can also pay 3 and 2 red and exile from your graveyard to make two 1-1 red elementals. Now, all three of these cards are already reasonable cards to play in modern, and Seasoned Pyromancer is still seen play mid-range decks to this day. Skull Clamp would let you cash in all these small, often not that useful 1-1s to draw two cards for just one mana. Drawing two cards is usually priced at about 3 mana, so this is an insane rate. Even better, unlike most draw spells, which you can only do once, Skull Clamp sits on the field and lets you keep sacrificing cards to draw more and more cards. Skull Clamp is such an egregious card draw spell that it's not all surprising the card was banned in almost every format it's been legal in. Could Skull Clamp be unbanned? No, absolutely not. This card is still incredibly strong and there are tons of great cards that can support it. If Skull Clamp was unbanned, it would either be the best deck in the format, or decks would warp themselves heavily around being able to counter those decks. How could Skull Clamp be fixed to be unbanned? Just make it give the creature plus one plus one instead of plus one minus one. Making players need to find some other way to kill the creatures would slow it down enough that the card would only be good rather than broken. The final card in this list is Dark Depths. This is a legendary snow land with the abilities where it enters the battlefield with ten ice counters on it. You can pay 3 to remove an ice counter from it, and when there are no ice counters on Dark Depths, you can sacrifice it and create Merit Lage, a 2020 black avatar creature token with flying, meaning it can't be blocked by creatures without flying, and indestructible, meaning it can't be destroyed by damage or destroy effects. So why was Dark Depths banned? This is another card where older formats, in particular Legacy, are really helpful for showing why these cards need to be banned. In Legacy, Dark Depths is the central win condition of a ton of different decks though all of these decks are fairly similar in that they're very land focused. Rather than paying 30 mana to slowly remove all 10 ice counters, they use cards like Thespian Stage and Vampire Hexmage to remove all the counters. Hexmage is pretty self-explanatory as you can just target the depths to get Merit Lage. Thespian Stage is a little bit more tricky, but basically Dark Depths ability only puts the counters on it when it enters the battlefield. So if you make Stage a copy of Depths, it won't get any counters because it's already entered the battlefield, so you end up with a copy of Dark Depths with no ice counters though you will have to sacrifice the original depths to the legend rule, which does make this combo just a little bit worse. With these cards, you can get your Mirror Delay Age token as early as turn 2 with Hexmage and Urborg, which will let your depths tap for black. Stage is a little slower, as you can only get it by turn 3, but it being a land makes it very difficult for your opponent to interact with the combo, as they can't counter a land drop. So, Dark Depths is the backbone of a fairly strong and consistent combo deck in Legacy, and it regularly puts up high finishes in the format. The combo would likely be too good in Modern, especially back in 2011 when other combo decks were significantly worse, so the card was banned at the start of the format. Could Dark Depths be unbanned? No, but it's pretty close. The combo is pretty fast, consistent, and powerful, but it's not that much better than some other combo decks already in Modern. The issue with Dark Depths is primarily that it's very hard to interact with. Indestructible means that most forms of removal don't work on the card. Even worse, it's possible to make the token at instant speed with the combos we mentioned, meaning that if you have the ability to make the token, you can just hold it over your opponent's head until they force you to activate it by doing something like trying to kill your Hex Mage, or even better, you can wait for them to tap out so that you know they don't have mana for something like Path to Exile. Lands are very difficult to destroy. In Legacy, there's a card called Wasteland that sees tons of play, and what it does is let you tap and sacrifice to destroy target non-basic land. This card does a lot to hold Legacy together, and one of the things it does is give decks a way to interact with land-based combo decks like Dark Depths. Modern has worse versions of this card, like Ghost Quarter, which lets you tap and sacrifice it to destroy target land, and lets its controller put a basic land from the deck into the battlefield. Or Field of Ruin, which requires you to pay two mana, tap it, and sacrifice it to destroy non-basic land, and then each player searches a library for a basic land and puts it into the battlefield. These cards do an okay Wasteland impression, but they are significantly worse. 
so in Legacy, players have access to all of the best removal to kill Marital Age, and a much better way to interact with their opponent's lands, and the deck is still really strong there. The deck doesn't lose too much coming from Legacy to Modern, so it would be almost the same deck, with way, way fewer ways for your opponent to stop the combo. The card's just a little bit too hard for your opponent to stop for it to be unbanned right now, even if the combo is similar in strength to other combos in the format. How could Dark Depths be fixed to be unbanned? Changing the way the card works so that activating the ability to remove a counter is what allows you to make a Marital Age, rather than it triggering whenever the card simply has no ice counters on it, would make it so that you'd have to pay 3 mana after using a combo to remove the counters, which would do the trick. That would put the card in a situation where it was still good, but it was slow enough that other decks could stop it before it killed them. Though, this is kind of just adding a mana cost to the card with extra steps, so you could also just shrink the Marital Age to being a 10-10 or a 15-15, so the token can't kill your opponent in one hit which would also give your opponent more counterplay without killing the card. Starting us off, we have Rite of Flame and Seething Song. Rite of Flame is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 1 red that adds 2 red to your mana pool and then adds an additional red for each card named Rite of Flame in all graveyards. This card was banned very soon after the start of the format back in September 2011. Seething Song is an instant with a mana cost of 2 and 1 red that adds 5 red mana. It was banned in January of 2013. These cards are going to be talked about together because of how similar they are and because they would see play in the same decks. We're going to do this a few times in this video because there are quite a few cards that are very similar and we're seen playing the same decks for the same reasons, so it makes sense to talk about them. Why were Rite of Flame and Seething Song banned? Rituals are what the community refers to as mana positive cards. This means they generate more mana for you than they cast. Being able to generate this mana is always nice because it lets you play your cards sooner or play more of them. The way these cards have usually seen play is in combo decks to be able to play their combos earlier. However, there's one combo deck that was able to make even better use of these cards in Nor. You see, there's a mechanic in Magic called Storm. What Storm does is whenever you cast a spell with Storm, you copy that spell for each other spell that's been cast this turn. So, if you can find a way to cast a whole bunch of spells, you can use a card like Grape Shot to deal 20 damage to your opponent. As unlikely as it may sound, it's actually pretty feasible to cast 20 spells in a turn and kill your opponent with Grape Shot, or at least cast 10 spells and cast 2 Grape Shots. Rituals, like Rite and Song, are a big part of that. You see, if you don't care about really accomplishing much, you can just cast a bunch of rituals to make a bunch of mana, cast a bunch of draw spells to find more rituals, and then keep casting them. Combine this with cards like Past and Flames to be able to recast all your rituals out of your graveyard, and a storm count of 10 or higher is completely feasible. However, you do need to hit some specific mana thresholds to cast cards like Past and Flames or Gifts Ungiven to keep your combo turn going. This is where Rite and Song are different from the rituals that are currently legal in Modern. Currently, Storm decks use Pyretic and Desperate Ritual, which cost 2 mana and add 3 red, meaning they only let you gain 1 mana as well as Mana Morphos, which costs 2 and adds 2 mana of any 2 colors, but also draws you a card. The amount of mana your rituals make is really important for Storm decks, as making more mana means your combo is faster and more consistent. It means you might need one less land to get the initial mana to go off, meaning you can combo earlier, and it also means you need less rituals in your hand to start comboing, meaning your deck is more consistent. And this is where Rite and Song differentiate themselves from other rituals. Rite makes you go plus one mana on the first cast, meaning it's exactly as good as Pyretic Ritual is. In fact, it's actually better because it asks you to use less mana at first, meaning it taxes your colors more. Anyone who's played Storm will tell you managing your colors of mana is pretty important. Rite would be the better card if it just cost one red and added two red, rather than costing two and adding three. But the ability to scale with more copies in your graveyard is what makes it truly broken. Casting two rites will generate four red mana, meaning you go plus three mana, where two pyretics will only let you go plus two mana. This difference in mana advantage is huge. Seething Song is a worse than Rite of Flame, as asking for three mana up front can make it pretty hard to work with. However, it lets you go plus two in mana right away, no questions asked. This is really strong, and five mana is a huge mana threshold of the deck. This gives you enough mana to cast past in flames with one mana left over to pay its flashback costs which is really important for the deck. Because of this incredible power, both Rite of Flame and Seething Song were banned to rein in the power of Storm decks in Modern. Could Rite of Flame or Seething Song be unbanned? Starting with Rite of Flame, the answer is no. Rite is a very, very strong ritual that would be great in not only Storm decks, but would also make some other combo decks way stronger than they are right now. Rite of Flame is the much stronger ritual, so it's more cut and dry than Seething Song. Seething Song might be able to be unbanned, but it would definitely have an impact on the metagame. Seething Song would see play not only in Storm decks, but in decks like Goblin Charbelcher, an artifact that costs 4 mana and allows you to pay 3 and tap it to reveal cards from the top of your deck until you reveal a land and deal 1 damage to any target for each card you reveal. 
This deck simply doesn't run any lands, so a single activation of Belcher will always kill your opponent. So if this deck can get 7 mana and a Char Belcher, they instantly win the game. This deck already runs a bunch of rituals, like Pyrectic to make the mana for Belcher, so giving them access to Song would make the deck a lot stronger. So, Seething Song would make decks like Storm and Belcher better, but those decks aren't particularly strong right now. While Storm used to be too strong, other decks have caught up to it over the years. Nowadays, they're a tier 2 deck at best, so it might not be an awful idea to try to power them up. Most decks have ways of dealing with these decks, and while this would enable the decks to pull off more 2 turn kills, they wouldn't be significantly more consistent than other 2 turn kills in the format. Still, Seething Song is a really strong card that could push the decks too much, so it's a probably rather than a yes. How could these cards be fixed to be unbanned? Rite of Flame is pretty much impossible to fix without just removing the effect to scale with more copies. It simply adds too much mana too easily, and besides, a 1 mana ritual that gives you 2 mana right away would still have a place in the modern metagame as is. Now, Seething Song doesn't really need to be fixed, because it could probably come back without any changes and be fine. One change that I do think would be a good idea is changing its cost from 2 and 1 red to 3 red, so you can't decrease its cost with Goblin Electromancer. And it would be harder to cast in general, but this isn't strictly necessary. Next up we have another pair of similar cards, Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time. Both of these are draw spells that use the Delve mechanic. Delve is an ability which allows you to exile cards from your graveyard to pay for a spell's mana cost. Each card you exile paying for one. Treasure Cruise is a sorcery with a mana cost of 7 and 1 blue, with the effect where you draw 3 cards. Dig Through Time is an instant with a mana cost of 6 and 2 blue, with the effect where you look at the top 7 cards of your library, put 2 of them into your hand, and then put the rest of the cards in the bottom of your library in a random order. And of course, both of these spells have Delve. Both of these cards were banned in January 2015, a mere 4 months after their release in Cons of Trakir in September 2014. Why are these cards banned? The problem with these cards is they basically always cost 1 and 2 blue, respectively. Exiling 6 or 7 cards from your graveyard just isn't very hard. Not only do most decks play fetch lands, which go to the graveyard after use, but there are tons of cheap, powerful spells that people are playing. Players usually have 5 or so cards in the graveyard by turn 3, and that's if they're not trying to put cards into the graveyard. If you actively want more cards in your graveyard, you can put more cards into your graveyard more quickly and more consistently. Now, some newer players might not get why a cheap draw spell is so broken. Let's talk about Ancestral Recall. This is an instant for 1 blue mana that simply has the effect where target player draws 3 cards. This is Magic's Pot of Greed, a card that lets you draw more cards for way too low of a cost. This is so good that Recall is one of the most powerful cards in the entire game. The amount of draw power it gives you versus the amount of mana it costs is entirely lopsided. Card advantage is a really important part of magic. If you think about your cards interacting with your opponent as a series of trades, where one removal spell kills one creature, whomever has the most cards will eventually be able to keep casting spells while their opponent can't do anything. This is called card advantage, and getting tons of card advantage is a really easy way to win a game. However, there's another big resource in magic besides cards. Mana. The mana system makes it so that card advantage isn't the only resource you have to manage. You also have to think about what's the best thing to spend your mana on at any time. This is why straight up draw spells like Divination aren't broken in magic. You have to trade impact with the board for getting more cards, so while you can get as much card advantage as you want, you can't stop your opponent from executing your game plan while you do that. However, with a card like Ancestral Recall, the mana cost is so low you don't really give up anything. One mana is so low of a cost for three mana that you basically get all of the upside of the card advantage without actually having to give up affecting the board. Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time, because exiling cards from your graveyard is such a low cost, are basically just a worse recall. Decks don't have to really sacrifice any mana or tempo to get these cards online, so both of these cards are banned for giving players way too much card advantage. Could Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time be unbanned? No, for either of them. The cards aren't really meaningfully different. Cruise is generally better in formats like Modern because it only costs 1 blue mana, meaning you can cast it for 1 mana if you have enough cards in your graveyard, while Dig is better in weaker formats like Pioneer. Still, the cards are simply too good for Modern. Not only have these cards not gotten worse over time, in some ways they've even gotten better. Right now, the best deck in the format is Murktide Regent decks. Murktide is a dragon with flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach, Delve, and the ability that it gets bigger for each instant or sorcery you exile to cast it. This deck is extremely good, and it would love to have access to Cruise and Dig to refill its hand in the late game. 
This isn't even the only deck that would greatly benefit from having Cruise and Dig back. With these cards unbanned, blue decks would be way too good in modern, and the best deck in the format would be even harder to beat. How could these cards be fixed to be unbanned? This is actually pretty easy, just change their cost to have more colored mana. If both these cards cost 3 blue mana and 5 generic mana, they would be good but not broken. The difference between 2 and 3 mana is huge, and making players pay 3 mana for these cards instead of 2 or even 1 in the case of Cruise would make these cards really good but not broken. Next up we have two less broken draw spells, Ponder and Preordain. Ponder is a sorcery with a mana cost of 1 blue with the effect where you look at the top 3 cards of your library and then put them back in any order. Then, you may shuffle your library, and then you draw a card. Preordain is a sorcery for one blue mana that lets you scry two, which means you look at the top two cards of your deck, and then put any number of them on top or the bottom of your deck in any order, then you draw a card. Both of these cards were banned in September of 2011. Why were Preordain and Ponder banned? Both of these cards are just really good consistency boosters. Almost every blue deck would want to run these cards. For reference, the two best cantrips, the community name for cheap spells that draw you a card, in Modern are currently Consider, an instant which lets you look at the top card of your deck and either draw it or mill it and draw a different card, and Serum Visions, a sorcery which lets you draw a card and then scry two, which is a lot worse than Preordain. These cards see tons of play in just about every blue deck, because cheap cards that let you find the cards you need in its specific situations are just so powerful. These cards were both banned to stop blue combo and mid-range decks from being so consistent. Could Ponder and Preordain be unbanned? This is a soft no. Unbanning these cards wouldn't break modern like unbanning the delve draw spells would, but it would have the very negative effect of over-centralizing the metagame. These cards have a really subtle impact on a format. They aren't the cards killing you, and they don't leave your opponent with a ton of cards in their hand and none in your own. They just make it so they have the cards they want more often. It's a lot more subtle because you don't really have exact knowledge of when the consistency boost is what is beating you. Still, unbanning these cards would make blue decks way better, and the best decks in the format are already blue decks. How could these cards be fixed to be unbanned? Well, we sort of already have fixed versions of these cards. Serum Visions and Consider are basically just worse versions of these cards, and there really aren't that many other ways to fix them besides making them cost one extra mana, which would also work. Next up we have Faithless Looting. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 1 red with the effect where you draw 2 cards and then discard 2 cards. It also has flashback for 2 and 1 red, which means you can cast it from your graveyard for its flashback cost, but it gets exiled afterwards. This card was banned in August of 2019. Why was Faithless Looting banned? Looting may seem quite a bit worse than some of the other cards we've talked about so far. Sure, it does help you find the cards you want, but you go minus 1 in card advantage when you cast it from your hand, because you have to use 1 card, then looting itself, to draw two cards and then get rid of two more. So you use three cards and only draw two. However, being able to fill your graveyard with so many cards on top of finding the cards you need proved to be way better than it seemed. Faithless Looting was an absolute staple in just about every red deck in Modern, especially graveyard-focused decks. Modern has a ton of great cards that want to be in your graveyard. Arc Like Phoenix is a 3-2 with Flying in Haste, meaning it can attack as soon as it enters the battlefield, and the ability where if you cast three more instants or sorcery spells on a turn, it returns itself from the graveyard to the battlefield at the beginning of combat. Vengevine is a 4-3 elemental with Haste that returns itself from the graveyard to the battlefield whenever you cast your second creature spell on a turn. Both of these two recursive threats were, at one point, a big part of one of the best decks in the format at some point in 2018 and 2019. These are only two of the multiple graveyard-focused decks that were on the top of the metagame and were playing looting. In fact, the best deck in Modern was a graveyard-focused deck playing Faithless Looting for a little over a year leading to its ban. Looting was so good at just throwing cards into your graveyard that it was basically redirecting the entire metagame towards graveyard strategies. This heavily graveyard-focused metagame led to multiple other bans as decks playing looting ended up being the best deck in Modern. The fact that looting was clearly pushing the meta towards these cards, and they had been problematic several times, led to the card being banned to stop graveyard-focused decks from becoming the best deck in Modern once again. Could Faithless Looting be unbanned? No. There are still tons of great graveyard decks that would be way too good if Looting was unbanned, and it's only a matter of time until a graveyard synergy card gets released that marks these decks extremely problematic. Having a card that decks can play turn 1 to start getting their cards into the graveyard as consistently as Looting does would make these decks way too good, and if they aren't too good right away, they will be in the future. How could Looting be fixed to be unbanned? We already have a fixed version of Looting in the format, called Faithful Mending, which is almost exactly the same, except in different colors, blue and white, is instant speed, and it costs 2 mana on the front end. This card isn't really a problem at all, 
so making it cost one more mana would fix the card easily. Another fix would probably make it so you only draw and discard one card. This would make it the same in terms of card advantage, but the number of cards it moves around would be so low that it wouldn't enable the same kind of graveyard decks anymore, though it would neuter the card a little bit too much. There's not that much you can do to find a happy medium for this card, where it's good but not broken, other than simply making it cost more mana. Finally, the last card we'll be talking about today is Arkham's Astrolabe. This is a snow artifact with a mana cost of 1 snow mana, which is 1 mana made by any snow permanent. It has the abilities where, when it enters the battlefield, you draw 1 card, and you can pay 1 and tap it to add 1 mana of any color. This card was banned in July of 2020. Why was Arkham's Astrolabe banned? Despite looking pretty unimpressive, this card actually had a huge impact on the modern metagame. Magic's color system is a really important part of its metagame, and restricting players to only two or three colors is generally a priority of Wizards of the Coast. If players have access to too many colors of mana, they'll be able to play all the same cards with no restrictions, which leads to very homogenized decks. To stop this, they print lots of cards like Blood Moon to punish non-basic lands and force players to play enough basic lands. And since they have to play basics, they can usually only play two or three colors. The problem with Astrolabe was that these decks were pretty much entirely able to have all of the colors without being able to be easily punished by cards like Blood Moon. This made it so that there were almost no cost to having a four-color deck, so Wizards banned the card to make four-color decks less consistent. Could Arkham's Astrolabe be unbanned? This one is kind of complicated, but I'm going to say no. The biggest issue with Astrolabe being banned is that there are cards that are basically just worse versions of it and are doing the same thing. Abundant Growth is an enchantment ore with a mana cost of 1 green that lets you draw a card when it enters the battlefield and give the land it's attached to the ability where you can tap it to add 1 mana of any color. Growth is worse in a few ways, requiring green mana instead of the less generic snow mana, which can be made off of any snow-covered basic, and isn't a snow card itself, so it doesn't count for things like Ice Fang Coatl. However, the main issue with the cards are the same. So, the problems with Astrolabe are real, but it being banned isn't really doing much, so the card should probably be unbanned or Abundant Growth might need to be banned too. This has been a debate in the community, but I think leaving the card banned is the better choice, as unbanning the card would make decks running growth even better, as most of them are still playing cards like Coatl. So, unbanning Astrolabe wouldn't change the metagame too much, but it would make 4 or 5 color mana piles an even bigger part of the format, which most players don't want, and Wizards has previously said they want to avoid. How could Arkham's Astrolabe be fixed to be on ban? The only real fix would be removing the draw a card ability on the card. There's already a card called Prophetic Prism, which is exactly the same, but costs 2 mana instead, so increasing the mana cost isn't an option, as the card already exists. Without the ability to draw you a card, this card becomes a big enough investment that 4 or 5 color decks wouldn't become so homogenizing. First off, we have Eye of Ugin. This is a legendary land with the abilities where all of your Eldrazi creatures cost 2 less to cast. It also has the ability where you can pay 7 mana and tap it to search your library for a colorless creature card and put it into your hand, and then you have to shuffle. This card was banned back in April of 2016. So why was Eye of Ugin banned? I actually saw a ton of play in Tron decks in Modern for years, but this has almost nothing to do with the card being banned. Tron decks try to use the Tron lands to cast giant creatures, such as the Eldrazi, extremely early. And Eye of Ugin pulled double duty by making your big, scary Eldrazis cheaper to cast and letting you constantly tutor up huge threats to keep casting. While this was really good, it was actually Eldrazi aggro decks that broke Eye of Ugin. You see, when the Eldrazi were first released in Rise of Eldrazi, the cheapest Eldrazi cards still cost 7 mana, which was more than the most expensive cards in most decks. So while I did help cast them, it wasn't letting you power them out on turn 1 or 2. This all changed with the release of Oath of the Gatewatch. In this set, Wizards released a ton of cheap Eldrazi, like Eldrazi Mimic and Thought Not Seer. With these cards and Eldrazi Temple, a land that tapped for 2 mana to cast an Eldrazi, you could flood the board with Eldrazi creatures extremely early, leading to tons of turn 3 kills. Even worse, a ton of these Eldrazi had really strong effects. Such as Thought Not Seer, which ripped a card right out of their hand when it entered the battlefield, or Reality Smasher, which required your opponent to two for one themselves to remove it. So not only was this deck extremely explosive, it also took a ton of resources away from you and took a ton of resources to try and remove their threats. This was so much better than all the other decks in the format, it was easily the best deck. Eldrazi aggro decks were taking four out of eight top spots in a ton of top tournaments and showing no signs of slowing down. To stop these decks from being the best deck in the format, Wizards banned Eye of Ugin, as it was previously obviously the most problematic card in the deck due to being able to basically give you 4 or even 6 mana on turn by reducing the cost of multiple spells. Could Eye of Ugin be unbanned? No. Modern has gotten a lot faster and stronger, but Eldrazi decks have still stuck around, 
even though they're much, much worse than they used to be. Having 8 copies of lands that essentially make 2 mana is incredibly strong. And having I back would make the explosive plays that Eldrazi aggro decks used to be known for come right back. Modern would be able to adjust to it better than they used to, with cards like Fury being able to remove multiple 1 toughness creatures on turn 1. But Thought not being able to rip important cards out of your opponent's hand while also applying tons of pressure is uniquely strong. Other decks can put out similar damage with good draws, but they can't interact with their opponent at the same time. Eye of Ugin and Eldrazi Temple just weren't designed to work with cheaper creatures, and having any cheap Eldrazi that are better than vanilla beaters makes the cards inherently problematic. How could Eye of Ugin be fixed to be unbanned? If the effect was changed to making Eldrazi spells cost one less to cast instead of two, it would probably be enough to let the card be unbanned. This would still make it very strong, but it wouldn't let you play a bunch of Mimics on turn one or Thought Knot on turn two. This makes the deck more explosive without being super explosive, and means they still have to draw two temples to rip a card from your opponent's hand on turn 2. This stops the deck from being the explosive heart tract with Menace, while leaving most of the effective Eye of Ugin intact. Next, we have Summer Bloom. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 1 and 1 green with the effect where you can play 3 additional lands this turn, which means with your normal land drop, you can play a total of 4 lands on that turn, which does stack with other copies of itself or other similar cards like Azusa Lost But Seeking. This card was banned in January of 2016. Why was Summer Bloom banned? Summer Bloom is really strong with some other land-based ramp spells, in particular Amulet of Vigor and Bounce Lands. Amulet is an artifact with a cost of 1 and the ability where, whenever a permanent enters the battlefield and under your control tapped, you untap that permanent. Bounce Lands are lands that enter the battlefield tapped and return a land from your field to your hand when they enter the battlefield, but tap for 2 mana. Combining Amulet with Bounce Lands allows you to use them for mana, and then either bounce them or another land to your hand. So if you have an Amulet, a Bounce Land, and Summer Bloom, you can play your Bounce Land up to 4 times in a single turn by always bouncing it back to your hand, and make up to 8 mana. Though you usually only make 6 mana, as you use your first land drop to get the mana to cast Summer Bloom on turn 2. That's fine though, as 6 mana is enough to play something like Primeval Titan. A 6 mana 6-6 six, six with Trample that searches for 2 lands and puts them onto the battlefield tapped whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks. This is a crazy combo, letting you get huge creatures and a ton of mana extremely quickly. Even worse, there are lands that can just straight up win you the game pretty easily. Volakut the Molten Pinnacle is a land that enters the battlefield tapped and taps for 1 red. And whenever a mountain enters the battlefield under your control, if you control 5 or more mountains, it deals 3 damage to any target. Combining this with Primeval Titan lets you get up to 5 mountains very quickly, letting you start bolting whatever you want as early as turn 3 with your best draws. This is extremely strong and made Summer Bloom combo decks one of the best decks in the format, able to end games as early as turn 3. In order to stop this combo, Wizards either needed to ban Bloom or Amulet, and they decided that Bloom was the more problematic card. Could Summer Bloom be unbanned? No. Amulet of Vigor, Primeval Titan, and Volakut already form the backbone of one of the best decks in Modern right now, and they've stayed good for years. Unbanning them would probably make the deck too good. And if Wizards ever wanted to make the deck better, they could just print a less busted version of the card later. How could Summer Bloom be fixed to be unbanned? Changing it so that you can only play two extra lands that turn would make it so that you can't play Primeval Titan off of it, a Bounce Land, and Amulet. This would still make the deck better, but not so much better that it would break the format. You could still pull these combos off, but they would require much more specific hands as it does right now. Next up we have Field of the Dead. This is a land that enters the battlefield tapped and can be tapped to add one colorless mana. It also has the ability where whenever it or another land enters the battlefield under your control, if you have seven or more lands with different names, you create a tapped 2-2 black zombie creature token. This card was banned back in February of 2021. So why was Field of the Dead banned? Well, seeing that getting 6 mountains over Valakut wasn't hard enough to stop the card from being great, you could imagine how strong Field of the Dead could be. Field saw play in the same kinds of ramp decks, but also enabled a bunch of different ramp decks in different color combinations, as well as being a fairly low cost include for decks that wanted a better late game and didn't mind it entering the battlefield tapped. There were a few things that make this card ban worthy, whereas Valakut isn't. First off, Valakut requirements are far more stringent. 6 lands with the mountain type is actually more strict than 7 lands with different names as there are tons of great lands that Wizards has printed over the years. This means that Volakut is mostly contained to specific combo decks, whereas Field can go into any ramp deck at all. This ultimately made the card far more impressive, as there was very little deck building cost to playing the card. Additionally, it being a land made the card incredibly difficult to interact with. Even if you had something like Field of Ruin to destroy it, your opponent would usually still get a zombie out of the deal, so they still got value. The only real answer to Field is a card like Blood Moon, which lots of decks can't afford to run. 
Once a ramp deck gets to 7 lands, it's extremely hard to come back, as they'll have a constant stream of threats for the rest of the game. This makes it really hard for any deck that isn't a combo or aggro deck to ever beat them, as they'll always outvalue any mid-range or control deck they play against. This also applies to Valakut, but it being easier to meet field's requirements and the fact that Amulet Titan decks could run both Valakut and field is what made this card so problematic. Field made these land-based decks more consistent, more generic, and even harder to interact with. Could Field of the Dead be unbanned? No. It would give Amulet Titan decks way too good of a matchup against too many decks. A lot of the sideboard cards that decks might play to stop Amulet Titan decks, like Alpine Moon, aren't anywhere near as useful. The combination of being so taxing on sideboard slots and being so hard for any fair decks to beat means that giving ramp decks another card, like Volokut, would be far too much and make anything other than aggro and combo decks almost impossible to play in the format. How could Field of the Dead be fixed to be unbanned? This is extremely hard to do without completely changing the card. Being a land means that it's basically impossible to give the card any kind of cost. On top of that, giving Valakut decks a second card with even a similar effect would make them very hard to beat. The best answer I can come up with is changing it from a triggered ability to something like pay 5, tap, and sacrifice it to make a zombie for each differently named land you control, with the restrictions that you have to have at least 7 lands of different names to activate this ability, and you can only do this at sorcery speed. This would make the card strong and leave it with a lot of the same effects that it has right now, but adding an actual mana cost would make it slow enough that it wouldn't be impossible to beat. Next up, we have Mystic Sanctuary. This is a land with the island land type, meaning it can tap to add 1 blue. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control 3 or more other islands, and when it enters the battlefield untapped, you can put target instant or sorcery from your graveyard on top of your library. This card was banned at the same time as Field of the Dead in February of 2021. Why was Mystic Sanctuary banned? Mystic Sanctuary was banned due to how it interacts with Fetchlands. You see, because Sanctuary has the island type, cards like Scalding Tarn can find it and put it directly into the battlefield, because they only care that they have the proper land type, not if they're basic or not. This means that blue decks, once they have three islands, can turn any of the four different Fetchlands that can find islands, meaning they can run 20 copies of that card to find it, and get back whatever instant or sorcery they want. This made blue decks extremely consistent. And if they ever need to find a card that already happened to be in their graveyard, they basically always could. Even worse, cards like Cryptic Command could return your own Sanctuary back to your hand, allowing you to play it again and get back whatever you want. With two Cryptics, you could actually loop Sanctuary every turn, making it so that you always draw Cryptic Command on your card for a turn. And since Cryptic also lets you counter a spell, draw a card, or tap all of your opponent's creatures, as well as bounce your Sanctuary, Pulling this loop off usually just won you the game, or at least made it so that your opponent can't ever win the game. The consistency of being able to get whatever you want out of your graveyard was the main reason this card was banned, but the cryptic loop certainly didn't help. Can Mystic Sanctuary be unbanned? This is another no. Sanctuary was way too splashable into too many decks, and it just kind of made blue decks a lot more consistent and powerful than other colors. Some of the strongest deck in modern are already blue decks, so unbanning it would just make them even stronger for no reason. Not to mention that it would lead to far more repetitive games and even cryptic command loops. This isn't as bad as other banned cards, though. It's a lot closer to being able to be unbanned than a lot of the other cards. How could Mystic Sanctuary be fixed to be unbanned? All that needs to change is removing the island type and giving it the ability to tap for blue without it. The only real problem with this card is being able to be searched off of fetch lands, so removing that fixes the card. Sure, Cryptic Command loops would still exist, but they wouldn't be anywhere near as bad without those decks being able to fetch Sanctuary whenever they want to start the lock. Making Sanctuary unfetchable fixes pretty much all the problems with the card. Last of all, we have Punishing Fire. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 and 1 red. It has the ability where whenever an opponent gains life, you pay 1 red to return it from your graveyard to your hand, and it has the effect to deal 2 damage to any target. This card was banned all the way back in December of 2011. Why was Punishing Fire banned? On its own, Punishing Fire isn't very good. The problem is combining it with the card, Grove of the Burn Willows. This is a land that you can either tap to add one colorless, or tap for one red or one green. And then each opponent gains one life. With this, you can force your opponent to gain life and make the red mana you need to give your Punishing Fire back. This basically means for the low cost of one red mana, and giving your opponent one life, you can get as many two mana shocks as you want. As slow as this is, it's actually viable to simply loop it over and over to kill your opponent. The main problem is that there's no way, outside of very specific cards like Graveyard Hate, to interact with this loop. Even counter spells, which are usually able to answer most cards, can't stop you from looping this and winning eventually. All you need is enough time. Luckily, Fire also helps you get that time by helping you deal with the board. Fire can also kill as many two toughness creatures as you want it to. This means that Punishing Fire is always at least okay. 
but it's backbreaking against any deck that relies on its one or two toughness creatures. Decks like Merfolk and Death and Taxes, which have historically seen a ton of play in the format, were pretty much unplayable while Punishing Fire was legal. To let these decks exist in the format, Wizards banned Punishing Fire, citing specifically how much it stifled these creature-based strategies. Could Punishing Fire be unbanned? This is another no. The issue with making creature-based decks bad is as present as ever. Now, there's already a card called Fury, which is a creature that you can cast for free by excellent a red card from your hand. But if you do, you have to sacrifice it when it enters the battlefield. And when it enters the battlefield, it deals 4 damage divided amongst any number of target creatures. Some people will say Fury does the same thing that Wizards claim Punishing Fire has done. However, that's more of an argument for Banded Fury more so than Unbanded Punishing Fire, if anything. Not only that, but Unbanishing Punishing Fire would make these creature-based decks even worse. Fury isn't a card advantage piece. Usually use two cards to kill two of your opponent's creatures. The reason it's so strong is the temple you get for getting to remove two threats for no mana. Punishing Fire would give these decks a way to fight these decks that's a card advantage engine. Meaning that decks would have an amazing temple and card advantage piece for those matchups, making it almost impossible for those decks to win the matchup. So, in the interest of not making creature decks even worse than they are, Punishing Fire should really stay banned. How could Punishing Fire be fixed to be unbanned? Making it so that the ability triggers when an effect an opponent controls causes them to gain life, you can pay one red to return to your hand, and that would fix the problem. The only problematic thing about the card is how it interacts with Burn Willows. Other ways to make your opponent gain life aren't really even worth trying to combo with Punishing Fire. The interaction between these two specific cards is really the only issue. Alternatively, you could make it so that it only hits players and not creatures, as the issue is how it punishes creature-based decks, not using the card as a way to win the game over the course of 20 turns. Starting us off, we have Krark Clan Ironworks. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 4 and has the ability to sacrifice an artifact to add 2 colorless mana. Krark Clan Ironworks was banned in January of 2019. So, why was Krark Clan Ironworks banned? So, to understand this, we need to understand the combos that Krark Clan was used in. Before we can do that, we need to go over a few niche rules interactions. Let's start with a simpler example. Let's say we have Ironworks, Mirror Retriever, and Chromatic Star on the battlefield. Mirror Retriever is a 2 mana artifact creature with the ability where whenever it dies, you return another target artifact from your graveyard to your hand. Chromatic Star is an artifact with a mana cost of 1. It has the abilities where you can pay 1, tap, and sacrifice it to add 1 mana of any color. It also has the ability where, whenever it's put from the battlefield into the graveyard, you draw a card. So let's say you want to sacrifice both your Retriever and your Ironworks to make 4 mana, and then use the Retriever's ability to return your Ironworks to your hand. This usually wouldn't be possible, as you either have to sacrifice your Retriever first, meaning your Ironworks won't be in the graveyard at the time it triggers, or you have to sacrifice your Ironworks first, meaning you can't sacrifice the Retriever for mana anymore. However, Magic has a few specific rules about when you can use mana abilities, and how abilities trigger while you're casting and resolving spells. You see, Ironworks ability is what's considered a mana ability, because it adds mana, and fits a few other restrictions, such as not having a target. This means you can activate while trying to pay the cost for spells or abilities, whereas normally you can't activate other abilities while you're paying for something else. Additionally, another rule is that triggered abilities won't go onto the stack until you finish paying for a spell or ability, or the effect that triggered them finishes resolving. What this means is that we can go to activate Star's ability, which will cause the game to prompt us to use mana abilities. Then, while paying the cost for Star's ability, we activate our Ironworks and sacrifice both Retriever and itself to add 4 mana. Since we're still in the process of paying for Chromatic Star's ability, we won't put Retriever's ability onto the stack until after we finish paying for it. So now we can pay the 1 mana for Star, and its ability will resolve and add 1 mana of any color. At that point, Retriever's ability will go onto the stack, and technically, Star's ability to draw us a card will as well, but that's not important here. Now that both of our Retriever and Ironworks are in the graveyard, Ironworks is a valid target for Retriever's ability. So by using the fact that abilities can't trigger until after we finish paying for a spell or ability, we can get around the catch-22 to use Retriever to get our Ironworks back. This principle was used by a very powerful deck called Eggs, because it ran a bunch of zero mana artifacts, which sort of look like eggs. Magic has a tradition of naming combo decks after breakfast and breakfast foods for some reason, and that's also contributed to this name. The deck used a far more complex version of this combo that involved a lot more moving parts, which we'll go over right now. First, we need to introduce a couple more cards. First off, we have Mox Opal, another card banned in Modern. This is a zero mana legendary artifact that you can tap for one mana of any color, but only if you control three or more artifacts. Opal was banned after Ironworks, so it was used in this combo. The other card is Scrap Trawler. This is a three mana, three two artifact creature with the ability where whenever it or another artifact is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you return another target artifact with a lower mana value from your graveyard to your hand. So if a three mana artifact dies, you can get back an artifact that costs zero, one, or two mana. So 
What you would do is get all five of these cards into the battlefield. First, you tap your Mox Opal for one mana of any color. Then you activate Chromatic Star. And since you're activating an ability that asks you to pay mana, we can activate abilities without anything triggering until the ability resolves. Now, we sacrifice Opal to our Ironworks, making two mana, and Trawler will uselessly trigger, as there are no artifacts with a negative mana cost. Now, we have two colorless and one mana of any color. We'll just use red mana for the rest of this example. Next, we sacrifice our Retriever to Ironworks. This gives us a total of four colorless mana and one red mana. And both our Retriever and our Trawler will trigger once we finish paying for Star, Retriever grabbing any other artifact, and Trawler getting an artifact that costs one or less black. Next, we sacrifice our Ironworks to itself to make two more colorless mana. Now we have Opal, Retriever, and Ironworks in our graveyard. Two Trawler triggers and a Retriever trigger waiting to go into the stack. And six colorless and one red mana. Now we pay for Star, getting to draw a card, and turning a colorless mana into a red mana. Now all of our triggers will go into the stack. And Trawler will see our Star die and give us another trigger. So our current status is Opal, Star, Retriever, and Ironworks in the graveyard. A Retriever trigger and three Trawler triggers getting back an artifact that costs zero, one, or three mana or less back. We also have five colorless and two red mana. With our triggers, we can get back all four of our artifacts. Now, these cards have a combined mana cost of seven, so we can cast them all again. So we've ended up back in the same spot, but we've drawn a card, so we can loop this as many times as we want to draw our whole library. Next, we repeat this loop, but we sacrifice our trawler instead, meaning that the loop will cost one less mana to do, meaning we can net one red mana. Once you got infinite cards and infinite mana, the deck would recycle Pride Spellbomb, an artifact that you can pay one red and sacrifice to deal two damage to any target to burn your opponent to death. If you're wondering why we need to do all of this while paying for Star, the reason is the same as in the simpler example. We need to use Retriever to get back Ironworks. Trawler can't ever get our Ironworks back, because it only lets us get cards that cost less than whatever we sacrifice. The only way for us to get our Ironworks, or our Trawler back, if we sacrifice that instead, is to use Retriever. And since we have to sacrifice it at an earlier step in the combo, we have to use the Mana Window technique to hold off the card triggering until after we finish sacrificing everything. Now that we've gone through this entire combo, we can discuss what was so problematic about it. First off, the combo was very strong. It could be powered out very quickly with the help of Mox Opal, and the ability finds their cards very easily thanks to being able to cycle their stars and the card Ancient Stirrings, a sorcerer for one green that lets you look at the top five cards of your deck and grab any colorless card from among them and put it into your hand, and throw the rest on the bottom of your deck in any order. This card was extremely helpful for putting this combo together. Now, besides being very strong and consistent, the deck had two more issues, taking a very, very long time to actually perform the combo, and requiring very specific rules knowledge. The time issues were skirted around by players usually conceding or allowing players to take shortcuts, but this takes a lot of communication. The other issue was a lot harder to get around. The fact that the deck used such a specific, difficult rules interaction to work made it a huge headache for a lot of players and judges. Players kind of needed to know how this worked to both play the deck and play against it. This leads to a few issues. First, lots of judge calls end up happening, contributing to the issue of the combo taking too long and slowing down tournaments. The second issue is that it makes understanding the rulings very, very important for being able to win. Now, understanding rulings is considered a skill in Magic, and knowing how the game's rules works and knowing how to use them to your advantage is a big deal. However, there is a point where knowing rulings is something that judges are supposed to do, not players, and wizards felt this rulings crossed the line in terms of being too specific and cryptic to be allowed to exist. Due to the combination of strength, possible issues with stalling tournaments, and the issues with rulings, Croc Clan Ironworks was banned to stop the deck. Could Croc Clan Ironworks be unbanned? From a power level perspective, probably. The banning of Mox Opal makes the deck much, much worse. Without it, the loops we mentioned don't exist anymore, and you'd have to use some other random zero mana artifact, which wouldn't add any mana and would make it so that you couldn't perform the loops properly. Now, there might be some very niche way to get the combo to work that I don't know about, but whatever it is, it would be far, far worse than Opal. This is a big enough hit that Ironworks could possibly come off the ban list with no issues. Of course, this isn't likely to happen because there are a couple of other issues with the card, namely the ruling issues and the time issues. These problems won't go away, but if Ironworks was bad enough to not see play, as it likely would be, they wouldn't come up anyway. How could Car Clan Ironworks be fixed to be unbanned? As I said, without Opal, the deck is weak enough that it could probably unban without issues. Next up, still sticking to egg decks, we have Second Sunrise. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 and 2 white, with the effect where each player returns each artifact, enchantment, creature, and land from their graveyard to the battlefield that was put there from the battlefield this turn. This card was banned all the way back in May of 2013, nearly a decade ago. Why was Second Sunrise banned? This card was banned due to enabling an older version of eggs, sometimes called Second Breakfast. The main engine of this deck was using Reshape, a sorcery with a mana cost of X, 
or any amount of mana, and two blue, with the additional cost that you have to sacrifice an artifact that allows you to search your library for an artifact card with a mana value of X or less and put it onto the battlefield. The deck would sacrifice any of its many eggs, paying zero for X, to go find Lotus Blue. This is an artifact with no mana cost, meaning it technically has a mana value of zero and has to spend three for zero. This means you can pay zero to exile it with three time counters, and then during each of your upkeeps, you remove a time counter. When the last is removed, you can cast without paying its mana cost. Additionally, Bloom has the ability where you can tap and sacrifice it to add three mana of any one color. This is a reference to the extremely powerful, extremely expensive, and extremely banned Black Lotus, with the same ability but no suspend. Once they have Blooms on the battlefield, you would float your board with cheap eggs like Chromatic Spear, Chromatic Star, and Conjurer's Bauble, which all lets you sacrifice them to draw a card. So you crack all your eggs for mana and cards, and then you cast either Second Sunrise or Faith Reward, which basically do the same thing, but Reward costs one more mana to get all your eggs back. You use Conjurer's Bauble to put them back on top of your deck, shuffle your deck with an effect like Scalding Tarn, and draw a whole bunch of cards and hope to draw into one of your eight copies of Sunrise to do this all over again. It's also really easy to draw more eggs or more ways to get blooms out, since once the loop happens, it's pretty easy to snowball into getting more and more mana and cards. It would usually win by looping Pride Spellbomb, just like more modern day egg decks. So why was this card banned, especially since Face Reward is still unbanned? Well, eggs had a really big problem, beyond just being a very annoying deck. The amount of time it took. More so than any other card we talked about, more than Sensei's Divining Top or Cart Clan Ironworks, this deck took a lot of time to play. You see, this is what Magic players and judges will sometimes call a non-deterministic combo. A deterministic combo is one that you can do the same way every time and always get the same result. The Ironworks combo we talked about earlier is deterministic because it does the same thing every time and always ends with the same pieces in play. However, the second Sunrise version of this combo requires you drawing specific cards from the top of your deck. Sure, you'll usually draw the right cards, but you can fizzle by drawing the wrong cards. This means you can't shortcut the process at all. With Ironworks, once you demonstrate the loop once and tell your opponent how it works and what the result is, you can say, I'd like to repeat this loop X times, and skip the nuts and bolts and skip to the board state the loop would result in. However, with a non-deterministic combo, you can't loop it at all. You have to do it the slow way every time. Even worse, because of the risk of fizzling, egg players would often sit and decide after seeing what they draw if they want to keep trying to combo off or stop there and try again next turn. This means that after every play, you'll have to wait for 10 or 20 seconds while they go over all the factors and try to decide what to do. The length of the combo, the fact that you can't shortcut it, and the fact that it requires so much thought to pilot means that the deck can take turns that take 20 or so minutes to complete, sometimes taking multiple 15 or 20 minute turns in a single game. This gets even worse when you go into Magic's time rules. When a game goes to time, the player gets five turns to finish their game, starting what's called turn zero and going up to turn five. Because you have to finish all five of those turns, after an hour for games to be completed, egg players could take a 20 minute turn before ending their game, holding up tournaments for an hour or more in the worst case scenarios. Due to how problematic this is for running events, the card was banned on top of being a very strong combo deck. Could Second Sunrise be unbanned? No, only because of time problems. The deck might not even be that strong nowadays, as there's been quite a bit of power creep, though the deck has gotten some new toys like War of Invention. However, due to the fact that one player playing this deck anywhere in the tournament can stall an event for so long, means that either the deck needs to be banned, or the time rules have to be changed. And we aren't going to be changing the time rules for one singular card. How could Second Sunrise be fixed to be unbanned? The only real fix is having the card exile itself when it resolves, so you can't recycle it. Though with face rewards still being able to recycle itself, and the deck still having 8 copies of the effect, it would probably still be too much and cause too many time problems. Really, having more than one version of this card in Modern is probably just too much. Next up, we have Birthing Pot. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 3 and 1 Phyrexian green, meaning it can be paid with either 2 life or 1 green mana. It also has the ability where you can pay 1 and 1 Phyrexian green to tap it and sacrifice a creature to search your library for a creature card with a mana value equal to 1, plus the sacrifice creature's mana value, put it into the battlefield, and then shuffle. This card was banned in January of 2015. Why was Birthing Pot banned? Pod is basically a repeatable tutor for creatures, which, as it turns out, is really, really strong. There are tons of great value creatures, like Eternal Witness, Ice Fang Coatl, and on math Locus of Creation that it can find for you. Even better, you can basically construct a specific chain of creatures that Pod can grab for you, usually ending a combo with a card like Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker. This is a card that you can tap to create a copy of a target non-legendary creature with haste, but you have to sacrifice it at the end of the turn. With a card that untaps a creature when it enters the battlefield, like Pestermite, you can make an infinite number of tokens and win the game. This is only one of the multiple combos Pod can help you put together. 
Pod was so good, not only at helping you find combos, but even just at finding the cards you wanted in a given moment, that it was banned because Wizards thought it was making creature decks too homogenized in the format. Could Birthing Pod be unbanned? This is a soft yes. There are other cards that are similarly good at what Pod does, namely Elementary's Call and Eldritch Evolution, and they do mostly the same thing that Pod does, and they haven't made creature decks too strong or homogenized. Now, Pod is definitely a lot better than these cards, or other cards that are similar to it, and it being a Phyrexian mana card means it can bleed into other colors more. Still, the power level of Modern has risen a lot, and the downside of Pod's mana and life investment has gotten a lot higher, so it wouldn't be anywhere near as dominant as it used to be. Not to mention, this is a card that a lot of players kind of want back, so it could come off the ban list and be fine, it might be worth considering just to give players what they want, though this isn't usually the approach a Wizards takes to ban lists, so it's pretty unlikely to be actually get banned. How could Birthing Pod be fixed to be on ban? It doesn't necessarily need to be fixed, but if Wizards wanted to make a weaker version of it instead of unbanning Pod, they could simply change the Vrex and Green Mana to normal Green Mana. The ability for non-green decks to play this card is one of the reasons it isn't a solid yes for an unban, as other similar creature tutors require actual green mana to use. A version without Phyrexian green mana would probably be the best compromise overall. Next up, we have Splinter Twin. This is an enchantment aura with a mana cost of 2 and 2 red. It has enchant creature, and the enchanted creature gains the ability where you can tap it to create a token copy of itself. The token gains haste, but you exile at the beginning of the next end step. This card was banned in January of 2016. Why was Splinter Twin banned? Splinter Twin was part of a two-card combo that was able to win the game on turn four. Since Twin basically gives Kiki Jiki's ability to any creature, you can basically use all the same combos with it. This means that with cards like Pestermite, you can simply use the ability to make a copy, use that copy to untap the original, and rinse and repeat until you have a swarm of hundreds of Pestermites to kill your opponent with. Now, a lot of people may ask if this is really ban worthy. After all, Kiki Jiki does the same thing, and he only cost one more mana. However, this one mana matters a lot. This means you can get the combo down a whole turn earlier, making it far, far stronger than Kiki. No deck would run Kiki as a combo enabler if it can get away with running Twin instead. Now, you may also say, hey, there are combos that can win on turn 2 or 3. How could a combo that's so much slower than that require a ban? The thing is, unlike other decks like Colossus Hammer and Infect, which win very quickly, the Splinter Twin combo is very low maintenance. You can kind of just throw it into any blue-red deck, usually control decks. Unlike lots of other combo decks, which are built around trying to find the combo pieces and pull that combo off as soon as possible, twin decks were usually focused on playing a fair control game until they find the combo and pull it off. Rather than slam their combo pieces into play whenever they could, they would wait until their opponent was tapped out and cast their Pester Might or Deceiver Exarch during their end step once they knew their opponent couldn't respond, and then go for the combo. This was something a lot of different mid-range and control decks could easily fit into their strategy if they were in the right colors. More so than the fact that the deck was good, the fact that this combo was pushing blue-red X decks to become Splinter Twin lists worried wizards, so they banned the card to allow more blue-red strategies to flourish. Could Splinter Twin be unbanned? Yes, absolutely. Currently, the best deck in modern is Izzet Merc Tide Regent, an Izzet aggro deck. This deck would have no interest whatsoever in playing the Splinter Twin combo, so it wouldn't cause any homogenization of the format. Splinter Twin decks would be strong, but they wouldn't force every Izzet deck to be a Splinter Twin deck. Some players will argue that this homogenization of the format was never really taking place, but what we should focus on is that it certainly wouldn't be taking place anymore. How could Splinter Twin be fixed to be unbanned? Splinter Twin could probably unban without any real issue, so it doesn't really need to be fixed. The last card we'll talk about in this episode is Deathrite Shaman. This is a 1-2 elf shaman with a mana cost of 1 hybrid black green mana, meaning it can be paid with either 1 black or 1 green mana. It has the ability where you can tap it to exile a target land card from the graveyard and add 1 mana of any color. You can pay 1 green and tap it to exile a target creature card from a graveyard and gain 2 life. Finally, you can pay 1 black and tap it to exile a target instead of sorcery card from the graveyard and have each opponent lose 2 life. This card was banned in February of 2014. Why was Deathrite Shaman banned? Deathrite Shaman does way too much for far too little investment. Shaman is able to fix your mana and ramp you off of either a black or green land, which is something no other card can do. Now, you do have to have lands in graveyard to exile it in order to be able to activate this ability, but that's pretty much a guarantee as just about every deck in modern relies on fetch lands for mana. So both graveyards should have plenty of fodder for Shaman. This is really problematic, as this level of ramp and color fixing makes four color decks very easy to run. We've talked about other cards that cause this issue before, but Deathrite is by far the most powerful of the bunch. Unlike other color fixing cards, Deathrite both accelerates your game plan and has two other extremely useful abilities. Gaining and Draining Life are both really good effects to have stapled onto an already useful card as there are tons of situations where they might come up. 
Not to mention, being able to exile cards from your opponent's graveyard can mess with their game plans a lot. It can stop them from reanimating a big creature, or get spells out of their graveyard before they can flash them back. Now, there are cards that can do something similar to Shaman already in the format, namely Birds of Paradise. However, Birds has a few big downsides compared to Shaman. Not only does it not have its other two very useful abilities, it also always costs a great mana, whereas Deathrite can cost a black mana if you want it to. The fact is, Deathrite is a one mana card that's extremely easy to cast, lets four color decks be extremely good, and is relevant all the way into the late game thanks to its other two abilities. This is why the card is banned. Even when compared to other cards that make multicolored decks too easy to play, Shaman is especially strong. Could Deathrite Shaman be unbanned? No. The card is still too good at making multicolored decks strong, and the extra upsides it has makes it a house in most matchups. Deathrite would be a huge upgrade for far too many decks, and would likely lead to a more homogenous format as decks would start splashing more and more colors to play it and all the other best cards in the format. How could Deathrite Shaman be fixed to be unbanned? Change its mana cost from a hybrid black-green to just a green and add one generic to both of its activated abilities. That's more than enough to make the card go from broken to just good. It would be a better Birds of Paradise at that point, but that's more than fine. As it stands, it's simply too easy to cast and has too much extra value when compared to other mana dorks and color fixing cards. Starting us off, we have Loris of the Dream Den. This is a 3-2 legendary cat nightmare with a mana cost of 1 and 2 hybrid white-black mana, which can be paid with either black or white. It has companion, each permanent card in your starting deck has a mana value of 2 or less. This means that at the beginning of the game, if you meet this requirement, you can reveal this card from your sideboard at the start of the game, and then you can pay 3 mana on your turn to put it from your sideboard into your hand. It also has lifelink, meaning it dealing damage also causes you to gain that much life, and it has the ability where, during each of your turns, you can cast a permanent spell with a mana value of 2 or less from your graveyard. This card was banned in March of 2022, meaning at the time of writing, it was only banned for about 6 months. So, why is this card banned? This is a bit of a different one. You see, Loris wasn't broken in any one deck, rather it was basically just played in everything. It's really easy to only play permanent cards with mana value or 2 or less, and in fact, in formats like Modern, you're generally encouraged to play the cheapest cards available, because games are just so fast. Running lots of cheap cards may give you a better early game, but it gives you a weaker late game. Fortunately, Loris completely shores up this weakness. You can play a deck with nothing but streamlined, efficient cards, and then still have a late game thanks to always having access to Loris. Because most decks are able to fulfill the card's restriction without giving up much of anything, and because this card required you to give up basically nothing, almost every deck played Loris when it was legal. However, Loris didn't only homogenize the format making everyone play it, it also homogenized the format by pushing tons of different cards out of the format. Lots of decks that could play Loris could also play cards like Gurmag Angler and Bedlam Reveler, which are both cards that cost more than 2 mana, but have ways to make themselves cheaper. Decks would consider playing cards like this all the time, but you would basically never trade playing Loris to be able to run these cards. Loris is just better when you look at it from just about every angle. Sure, Reveler can give you a better late game by letting you draw extra cards, but Loris does the same thing, and you don't have to draw into it. Sure, Del spells like Gurmag are big threats, but why play them when you can use Loris to recast all your Tarmogoyfs again? On top of all that, Loris was a free 8th card in your opening hand every game, giving it an even bigger edge over all these other cards. It's hard to convey just how ubiquitous the card was when it was unbanned. Not only was it seen play everywhere, it was shaping what decks were good and what cards you played in those decks. Cards that saw a little bit of play beforehand, like Mishra's Bobble, started to see play everywhere because of how it interacted with Loris, essentially letting you draw another card every turn. Worst of all, because of how the mechanic worked, you were seeing it basically every game. Usually your opponent has to at least draw into the power cards, but Loris tutored itself up at the start of every game. Seeing how powerful and ubiquitous the card was, and how it wasn't ever going to go away, Wizards ended up banning the card to make the metagame more diverse. Could Loris be unbanned? No. None of the problems have gone away. Sure, there are some decks that wouldn't play Loris, but a huge number of decks still would, and it would homogenize all those decks a ton. Not to mention, a big part of why this card was banned was because of how hated it was by the community. People really didn't like the impact it had on games and how many cards it pushed out of the metagame, so they'd be very unhappy to see it return. How could Loris be fixed to be unbanned? The only real fix is just completely removing the companion ability. This is a topic we can make an entire video about, but the gist is that introducing these kinds of mechanics completely change how a card game is played. Commander plays entirely different than the rest of Magic, largely to having a commander you can cast every game. Other games like Yu-Gi-Oh! with a similar mechanic play entirely differently because of their extra deck. Ask any Yu-Gi-Oh! player, they'll tell you that if the extra deck was removed, it would be an entirely different game. Introducing companions essentially changes the way Magic plays at a fundamental level. This is why the community's opinion on companions is generally that all of them should be banned, or the companion abilities should be eroded and essentially deleted. 
The cards are either too good, or just about every deck is playing them, or they're too restrictive and not worth playing at all. Looking at the other companions, all the ones that have restrictions that players can meet without making their decks terrible see play, and all the ones that are too restrictive, like Umori the Collector, just don't see any play at all. They're essentially only used as a free card for decks that could already play them. Loris was the worst because it was incredibly powerful on top of being essentially free to play for a lot of decks. The only fix is giving it a worse restriction, which is basically just removing the companion ability, or taking its abilities away, which is just making it an entirely different card. Even bumping up the mana cost wouldn't quite do enough. Wizards already did that by rotting the entire mechanic to cost 3 extra mana to use, and Loris still got banned anyway. Again, this is something we could spend an entire video covering, and if you want to see that, you should go ahead and tell us in the comments down below. Next up, we have Oko, Thief of Crowns. This is a legendary planeswalker with a mana cost of 1, 1 green and 1 blue, and a starting loyalty of 4. It has the abilities where you can plus 2 him to make a food token, which is an artifact token with the ability where you can pay 2, tap, and sacrifice it to gain 3 life. It has the ability where you can plus 1 it to turn target artifact or creature into a 3-3 green elk with no abilities. You can also minus 5 it to exchange control target artifact or creature you control and target creature your opponent controls with power 3 or less. This card was banned in January of 2020. Why is Oko banned? It's a bit hard to put into words how much control over a game an early Oko can have. You see, Oko can make your board full of creatures, or remove almost any threat your opponent plays all on its own, and it can do all of this while gaining loyalty. You see, by using Oko's plus 2 to make a food, and then using his plus 1 to turn it into an elk next turn, you can make a 3-3 elk every other turn. On the other hand, if you don't want to make many elks, you can use the plus 1 to shrink your opponent's threats into 3-3s, and then just trade them for any elk you've made. With the help of mana dorks like a Gilded Goose to give you extra mana, you can get Oko out as early as turn 2. There's not really any creature your opponent could play at that point that could kill Oko in one swing, which means he'll probably be able to make an elk to contest the board. This means you'll have to put a lot of resources into killing your opponent's Oko, and they'll just be able to keep making blockers the entire time. This isn't even taking into account anything else they play on their turn, and all of this is happening while Oko is getting more loyalty and becoming harder and harder to kill. It's worth comparing this to other 3 mana planeswalkers to see what similar powerful cards could be doing for this much mana. Gris the Hunger Tide lets you make a 1-1 green and black insect token on a plus 1, and you can minus 2 him to sacrifice a creature, and when you do, you destroy target creature or planeswalker. Oko takes a bit longer, but he makes much, much larger creatures that are likely to trade in combat with your opponents. He can't straight up remove a creature, like Gris can, but he can do it on a plus, and it doesn't require you to sacrifice anything to use the ability. On top of that, since Oko makes you 3-3s, three turn your opponent's creature into a 3-3 three three is basically removing it a lot of the time. Liliana of the Veil can make both players discard a card on a plus 1, and can force your opponent to sacrifice a creature on her minus 2. The story is similar here. Oko can't quite completely remove a creature, but he can do it on a plus 1. If we compare all these cards, we can see that Oko has abilities that are slightly better, and gain him loyalty instead of costing loyalty. And both of these two Planeswalkers are considered pretty strong, and still see played modern to this day. This is the big difference between Oko and these cards. Oko isn't too bad if you can get rid of him right away, but he does have a big impact on the game the turn you play him, and if he doesn't get removed, he'll start to run away with the game and become pretty much impossible to kill. The combination of being so hard to remove and being so strong led to this card being a huge headache to deal with, and Wizards banned this card because it was way too strong. At the time of its ban, Oko appeared in about 40% of competitive modern decks, which is a huge overrepresentation for a card like this. This is a two-color card that only specific decks can play, and it pushes you into a pretty specific deck archetype. For the format to be that bent around it shows that it was clearly warping the format too much. Could Oko be unbanned? No. It would still be amazing to the decks that would want it, and some of the best decks in the format could be made better by including the card. This card is still really hard to beat, and the shells the card would be played in have only gotten more powerful. How could Oko be fixed to be unbanned? This is something that's been talked about a lot, but Oko's abilities gaining him too much loyalty is where most of his problems come from. If the ability to make him food was a plus one, and the ability to turn them into an elk was a minus one, the card would be very strong still, but fair. The real issue is that Oko gains too much loyalty far too quickly for people to catch up with if it comes down early, and they don't immediately have the answer. So lowering the amount of loyalty he gains would fix the issue. Next up we have Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. This is a 6-6 legendary elder giant with a mana cost of 1, 1 green, and 1 blue. It has escape for 2 green and 2 blue, and exile 5 of the cards from your graveyard, which means you can cast it from your graveyard for its escape cost. It has the abilities where, when it enters a battlefield, you sacrifice it unless it escapes. And whenever it enters a battlefield or escapes, you gain 3 life and draw a card, then you can put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Uro was banned in February of 2021. Why is Uro banned in modern? 
Uro is a really strong late game threat that you have to have very, very specific answers for to actually deal with. Because it can come back any number of times and draws you a card every time it enters the battlefield, simply destroying it every time they cast it isn't enough. If you do that, Uro will almost certainly run away with the game. That's assuming they have the answers every time. If they can't kill it, then Uro is really scary. 6-6 six, six is really big in terms of stats, and the extra card every turn can make it basically impossible to come back from. Now, being an amazing late game threat is great, but there are tons of good late game threats, even ones that are recursive that aren't banned. For example, Uro's cousin, Kroxa, is really strong for all the same reasons as Uro, and sees tons of play, but he's not banned anywhere. The issue is that Uro's enter the battlefield and attack trigger is just far stronger. For one, Uro will always get you value, as you can always draw a card, but Kroxa won't get out a card of your opponent's hand unless they have one. Additionally, Uro is better to play out of your hand than Kroxa is. Cards like Explore allow you to draw a card and then play an extra land for 2 mana. Explore is a pretty strong card that sees play in formats like Modern. Uro only asks for 1 more mana, and it allows you to gain some life and gives you access to cast an Uro from the graveyard later. This means that it's already a pretty strong card. And that's not even getting to how strong it is as a late game threat. The combination of being a strong spell on the front end and being a great card in the late game made it very hard to beat. Most cards that give you this strong of a late game are kind of bad, or at least subpar if you draw them early, but Uro is great at every stage of the game. There really wasn't a point to playing any other color combinations if you were a mid-range or control deck, as going blue-green and playing Uro was always just better. So to make these decks less dominant, and to make more space for color combinations for mid-range decks, Wizards banned this card. Could Uro be unbanned? No. Green-blue X would still benefit too much from it, and it would push already good decks like Yorion Blink decks into an even more dominant position in the metagame. How could Uro be fixed to be unbanned? This card's in a pretty rough spot from a design perspective, as it's supposed to be a mirror of Kroxa, and all of its abilities reflect that. Changing any of them would kind of mess up the idea. The best way to keep all of the effects and keep it similar to Kroxa would probably be to make it so that you can either gain 3 life, draw a card, or put a land into play on its enter the battlefield or attacks trigger. This would make cast it from your hand a lot worse, so it would be close to where Kroxa is in power level. It would still be better than Kroxa, but it wouldn't be so strong as to push everything else out of the format. As strong as Uro is in the late game, the fact that casting him from your hand was so close to just being a playable card on its own is what made it so oppressive. Next, we have Microsynth Lattice. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 6. It has the abilities where all permanents are artifacts in addition to their other types, all cards that aren't on the battlefield, spells, and all permanents are colorless, and finally, players can spend mana as though they were mana of any color. Microsynth Lattice was banned in January of 2020. Why was Microsynth Lattice banned exactly? On its own, the card doesn't do much. However, there are a few synergies with the car that makes it a lot scarier. Specifically, Karn the Great Creator. This is a Planeswalker with a mana cost of 4 and the abilities where the activated abilities of your opponent's artifacts can't be activated. You can plus 1 Karn to turn target non-creature artifact into an artifact creature with power and toughness equal to its mana value until your next turn. And you can minus 2 him to find an artifact card you own from your exile or your sideboard, reveal it, and put it into your hand. The important part of these two cards are Karn's ability to prevent your opponent from activating artifacts, and Microsynth Lattice's ability to make all permanents artifacts in addition to their other types. You see, tapping your lands for mana is an activated ability, and since they're now artifacts, they won't be able to tap for mana anymore. This means that once you get Karn and Lattice down, your opponent won't be able to cast any more spells unless they happen to cost zero mana. Now, it's worth mentioning that Microsynth Lattice existed for years with similar combos being available and not seeing play. Cards like Stony Silence can do basically the same thing with Lattice, but they never saw play together. There are two big differences here though. First off, Karn's effect is one-sided, meaning you can still keep casting all your spells, whereas Stony Silence will stop you too. The second, even bigger difference, is that Karn can actually find your Lattice for you. This is the really big problem. Unlike combining Lattice with Stony Silence, which is a two-card combo, Karn with Lattice in the sideboard is basically a one-card combo. As soon as you get 10 mana, you can just play card and fetch Lattice to lock down the game. This is way, way too hard to deal with. Decks that can make this much mana are usually full of big, expensive threats that can end the game, which will force your opponent to either try to win very quickly, or use resources answering their threats. This is a problem because you need to keep your mana open to deal with the card Lattice lock, because you have to answer one of the pieces as soon as they cast him, or you'll be locked out forever. This just wasn't practical given how many other threats they were playing, and so Wizards banned Microsynth Lattice to weaken these decks and allow for more counterplay. Could Microsynth Lattice be unbanned? No, not with Karn still legal in the format. Honestly, only one of the two needs to be banned, and considering that Lattice was legal for years in the format with no issues, it kinda seems like Karn is the actual problem card in the combo. 
Still, that's a much larger discussion that would involve going into how Karn is currently seeing play to see if he should be banned instead. The real takeaway is that just one of them does still need to be banned. How could Microsynth Lattice be fixed to be unbanned? There's not much you can do besides just removing the text to turn everything into an artifact. The efficiency of the combo doesn't really even matter very much. Karn is still tearing up modern, and even if you increase the cost of Lattice to 9 mana, people would still play it. Because giving up a sideboard slot is just such a small cost that the upside of just winning the game if you can pull it off vastly outweighs it. One fix is making it so that Lattice only turns non-land cards into artifacts, but that essentially neuters the card entirely. There's basically no way to fix the card without either making it unplayably bad, or just entirely changing the ability. And to round off this video, we have Tybalt's Trickery. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 and 1 red. It has the effect where you counter target spell, and then its controller mills 1, 2, or 3 cards chosen at random. Then they exile cards from the top of their library until they exile a non-land card with a different name. They can cast that spell without paying its mana cost, then they put all the other cards that exile on the bottom of their library in a random order. This card was banned in February of 2021. Why is Tybalt's Trickery banned? You see, this card isn't actually very good at stopping your opponent. Red might not get very many counter spells, but the risk of giving your opponent another, better spell is too great. However, if you use it to counter your own spells and build your deck right, you can use it to cheat out massive threats, like Ermacol, the Eons Torn, or Omniscience extremely early. The best way to do this was with Cascade spells. Cascade is a mechanic where, whenever you cast a spell with Cascade, you exile cards to the top of your deck until you exile a card that costs less. You can cast that spell without paying its mana cost, and then you put all the exile cards in the bottom of your deck in a random order. By casting a spell like Violent Outburst and not playing any cards that cost less than 3 mana besides Trickery, you can make sure that you'll always find a Trickery off of an Outburst. Then, since Outburst will still be on the stack, you can use Trickery to counter it and then spin it into one of your payoffs. Now, the interesting thing about this card is that it wasn't banned because it was too good. Rather, Wizards felt the deck created a lot of non-games where your opponent either happens to have the counter spell for your combo, or they don't. Neither player really had to put much thought into their plays, and there wasn't that much counterplay unless you already happened to be playing cards that were good against the deck. This was generally considered by both Wizards and the community to be unfun and uncompetitive, so the card was banned. Now, before we continue, I want to discuss why Trickery is banned and other, similar combo decks aren't. Other combo decks, like Goblin Charbelcher, are still allowed in Modern, and you can make similar arguments about those decks. For those who don't know, Charbelcher is a deck that tries to cast and activate Charbelcher without playing any lands in their deck using cards like Model Dual Face Lands, which aren't considered lands for Charbelcher's ability, and Rituals to make the 7 mana you need. However, there are a few differences here. First off, Charbelcher is easier to interact with. Charbelcher decks can sometimes play similarly to Trickery decks, but they often have to play their Charbelcher and not activate it on the same turn, which opens them up to more forms of interaction. They're also weak to more sideboard hate, being weak to basically all the cards Trickery decks are, as well as effects like Pithy Needle. It's also less consistent, as there are only 4 Charbelchers, whereas Trickery had many, many Cascade spells it could play. Finally, Charbelcher also has a lot more moving parts, taking a lot more skill to pilot and play against. Charbelcher has to think about how it uses its rituals and how to use cards like Recross the Paths to help find their combo pieces. The mulligan decision is a lot deeper in Charbelcher, whereas in Trickery decks it was literally just, do I have a Cascade spell, yes or no. Trickery really does feel like flipping a coin to see if you win a lot of the time, with very few real decisions for either player to make. Because of just how little interaction and actual decision goes into playing Trickery, it was considered a uniquely unfun deck that needed to be banned. Could T-Bolt's Trickery be unbanned? No. Again, the problem with this card wasn't the power level, it was how unfun it was. This just isn't the kind of deck Wizards think should exist in Modern. It is worth mentioning that decks like this do exist in older formats like Legacy, where there are tons of combo decks that just kind of force you to have a Force of Will in hand. The thing is, everyone kind of knows that's how Legacy works. It's a format that's held together by zero-man interactions, and blue being overrepresented in the metagame is expected. Modern follows the philosophy of trying to allow more colors and more types of decks to exist in it, and Trickery is more of a problem in that kind of metagame, because you're not expecting everybody to be running counter spells or lock pieces to specifically stop these kinds of combo decks. How could T-Bolt's Trickery be unbanned? Simply making it so that it can only counter spells you don't control would fix the card. Funnily enough, the milling a random number of cards line was designed to stop Trickery from being able to be used in the way it was, to stop players from using things like Brainstorm to hide Ermacles on the top of their library. I don't know why they didn't just use as much simpler line of text, as they've done similar things before, and it would actually make the card easier to resolve anyway. We'll start by mentioning two cards that were played in the same deck, Bridge from Below and Hogok Arisen Necropolis. Bridge from Below is an enchantment with a mana cost of 3 black with the abilities where, whenever a non-token creature you control dies, if a bridge is in your graveyard, you create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. And whenever a creature an opponent control dies, you exile Bridge from your graveyard. 
This card was banned in July of 2019. Hogok is an 8-8 legendary avatar with a mana cost of 5 and 2 black-green hybrid mana. It has abilities where you can't spend mana to cast Hogok. It has Convoke, meaning you can tap your creatures to cast the spell, each creature you tap paying for one of the one mana of the creature's color. Delve, meaning you can exile cards from your graveyard to cast a spell, each card you exile paying for one. It has Trample, meaning excess combat damage is dealt to the defending player. And finally, you can cast Hogok from your graveyard. Hogok was banned in August of 2019. Now, why were these cards banned? Before the release of Hogok, Bridge was seen playing a deck called Bridgevine. This deck was named after Bridge from Below and Vengevine. Vengevine was a 4-3 with haste, meaning it can attack the same turn enters the battlefield, and the ability where, whenever you cast your second creature spell on a turn, you can return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. This deck basically just wanted to mill as many bridges and vines as it could using creatures like Stitcher's Supplier, a 1-1 for 1 that mills you for 3 whenever it enters the battlefield or dies, or cards like Faithless Looting, which was unbanned at the time and was actually banned at the same time as Hogok. It would cast a whole bunch of creatures like Gravecrawler, which could be cast from your graveyard as long as you control a zombie, to bring back Venge Vines. Then it would sacrifice its own creatures to cheap sack outlets to make zombies off the bridge. The deck was very good at putting the card it wanted into the graveyard very quickly and making a huge board full of zombies. The thing about Bridge is that it's stacked with multiple copies. So if you had two bridges in your graveyard, one Gravecrawler, and a way to kill it, you could sacrifice your crawler twice, making two zombies each time, putting out a total of four 2-2s. Two the deck wasn't just good at putting out tons of damage, however, it was also really consistent. Most of the deck's cards just needed to be milled to be turned on, and since milling is priced a lot cheaper than drawing cards, it got to these combos together a lot more often than other decks. This deck was very strong, but not necessarily broken. The straw that broke the camel's back was Modern Horizons. This set introduced two very powerful cards to Modern, Hogok and Altar of Dementia. We've already talked about Hogok, but Altar was similarly important. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 2 and the ability where you can sacrifice a creature to make target player mill cards equal to its power. These cards were individually very good in the deck. Hogok was very easy to cast as the deck was great at milling itself, giving them cards in exile for the delve cost. And the deck played lots of creatures and made lots of tokens off a of bridge, giving it tons of creatures to tap to pay the colorless mana cost. And of course, Hogok, like all the best cards in the deck, just needed to be milled to be turned on letting you get access to it very easily. Altar was the new de facto best sacrifice outlet for the deck. While the other sack outlets were only one mana, the extra power and consistency for milling cards off of Altar was just too much. However, while these cards were individually very powerful, the real problem was how they interacted together. The problem was that it was very easy to simply loop Hogok over and over with Altar and Bridge. What you would do is you would cast Hogok and then sack it with Altar and then target yourself with the ability. If there were at least two bridges in your graveyard, you could make two zombies and then mill eight cards. This would give you the five cards needed to delve to cast Hogok and two creatures you would need to convoke it. So you could cast it again and again, making more and more zombies each time. This meant that the deck no longer had to go to combat to win anymore. After milling your whole deck by looping Hogok, you would often have enough power in play to mill at least 60 cards from your opponent's deck, winning the game right away. However, this often wasn't possible, as if you got unlucky and didn't mill your bridges soon enough, you wouldn't make enough zombies. This didn't really matter though, as you would just do the loop a couple of times instead and end on a board full of zombies, a massive Hogok, and more than enough power to kill your opponent on the next turn. This would basically force them to have a board wipe to not die, and even if they did, you could just make a massive board again the next turn, and the turn after that, and the turn after that, and so on and so on. This deck wasn't just too good, it wasn't just broken, it was maybe one of the most powerful, most ever centralized deck the format has ever seen, easily on par with Eldrazi Winter, if not worse. Hogok was by far the best deck in the format, and it was winning basically everything. Pretty soon, half of most top 8s were Hogok decks, if not more. Wizards responded by banning Bridge from Below in July to weaken the deck and stop these loops. However, this proved to not be enough, as graveyard-based Hogok decks were still winning far too much. So just a month later, Wizards banned Hogok as well to finally stop his reign of terror, and hit Faithless Looting while they were at it to finally stop graveyard decks from being the best deck of the format. Could Bridge from Below or Hogok be unbanned? We have to cover each of these separately. First off, Bridge from Below. This is going to be a soft no. Bridge is still really strong, and while Bridgevine was okay in the format, it was still a very strong deck, and Alter made the deck a lot better. Not to mention, Bridge will only get stronger with time. It's very likely that there will be more decks that are able to abuse it and break it in the future, even without Hogok, so keeping it banned is the better choice. Next up, Hogok. This is a hard no. Hogok was too good even without Bridge, and even though it won't have looted anymore, Graveyard decks have shown to be strong anyway. 
One of the better decks in Modern right now is Living In, showing that graveyard-focused strategies can still be very strong, even with the better graveyard interaction cards that have been printed since Hogok's banning, such as Endurance. How could these cards be fixed to be unbanned? Starting with Bridge, the best I can think of is giving it a once-per-turn clause. Letting you make multiple zombies a turn with it is simply too good for a card that requires no resource investment at all. That might still not be enough, but it would be close. On Hogok's end, I would probably remove the ability to cast it from your graveyard. This card is simply too strong for a card that doesn't have to be drawn to be used, especially considering its cost can be paid by milling cards. If you had to actually draw it, that would make it a very strong card, but not a free 8-8 beater like it was in the decks that played it, and would stop you from looping like Bridgevine decks used to do. Next up, we have Yurion the Sky Nomad. This is a 4-5 legendary bird serpent with a mana cost of 3 and 2 hybrid white-blue mana. It has Companion, your starting deck has 20 more cards than the minimum deck size. This means that at the start of the game, if you meet its Companion requirement, you can reveal it from your sideboard, and then you can pay 3 to put it in your hand from your sideboard later on in the game. It has Flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. It also has the ability where, when it enters a battlefield, you exile any number of non-land permanents you both own and control, and then return those cards to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. This card was banned in October 10th, 2022, making it the most recently banned card in the entire format. So, why was Yorian banned? This card was extremely powerful. It was played in one of the best decks in the format, specifically for color on math decks. However, the reasons Wizards citing for the card being banned go simply beyond too strong for the format. In particular, Wizards cite the fact that the card requires you playing an extra 20 cards in your deck, along with a card leading to very repetitive gameplay, being the reason the card was banned. According to Wizards, because you have to run 80 cards to play Yorion as your companion, this means your deck will physically be larger and therefore more difficult to shuffle. Combining this with all of the fetch lands in Modern, and this can add substantially onto the amount of time and effort it takes to play Yorion decks. Now this, strictly speaking, is true. However, most of the community agrees that this is a pretty weird reason to ban a card, and Wizards has never banned a card for this reason before. However, this isn't the only reason why Wizards banned Yorion. The other issue that's cited is the fact that Yorion decks are often very repetitive and take very long turns. Yorion is usually played with cards with Enter the Battlefield triggers, such as Onmath or Ice Fang Coatl. This means that resolving Yorion will usually involve resolving a bunch of other triggers, which takes a lot of time. Combine this with the fact that Yorion is always an available option to the Yorion player, and you get very long repetitive games where the non-Yorion player ends up sitting and doing nothing for quite a long time. Combine that with the card's general power level, and Wizards decided to ban the card. Now, could Yorion be unbanned? This is a soft no. While the reasons Wizards gave are a bit strange, they are technically true. Combine that with the fact that the community, at large, is very happy to see Yorion go, and unbanning Yorion is something that no one really wants. It's not that the card strictly needs to be banned, more than everybody seems to prefer the format without Yorion. How could Yorion be fixed to be unbanned? The only real solution here is to remove the companion ability. Next up, we have Cloudpost. This is a Locust land with the abilities where it enters the battlefield tapped, and you can tap it to add one colorless for each Locust on the battlefield. This card was banned all the way back in September 2011, right after the format was conceived. Why was Cloudpost banned? Well, Cloudpost is basically the better Urza Tron, which is why it's what most people play instead of Tron in Legacy. So, what is Urza Tron, and why is a better Urza Tron too good? Urza Tron is a deck built around the three Urza lands, Urza's Tower, Urza's Mine, and Urza's Power Plant. These lands have the ability where, if you control at least one of each of them, they can tap to add two colorless or three colorless. What people will do is play land tutors like Expedition Map and Sylvan Scrying to search up the missing pieces of Tron to try to get all three pieces in play as soon as possible, and then play massive colorless threats like Ulamog the Sleaseless Hunger and Ugin the Spirit Dragon. These cards are pretty hard to beat, so there are two ways you can try to beat Urzatron decks. You either have to kill them before your opponent can put the combo together, or you have to stop them from assembling all three Tron lands. Aggro decks like Burn just do their plan, but faster against Tron, but mid-range and control decks have to play a lot of cards like Ghost Quarter and Fulminator Mage to destroy the Tron player's lands. The reason Cloud Post is better than Tron and why it was banned is because it's more consistent and can use its mana on early turns on other cards. You see, there are two Locust lands, Cloud Post and Glimmer Post, which grants you a life for each Locust when it enters the battlefield. To get more Locusts, decks in Legacy use cards like Vesuva, which enters as a copy of any other land on the battlefield. This gives them the same number of key lands to find, but they don't need one of each. They just need to Cloud Post some more Locusts to start making tons of mana. This leads to two major differences. This means you can't simply blow up one of their lands to shut down all of the Locusts, which a lot of decks relied on being able to do to slow down Tron decks. 
It also means I can afford to spend mana on things other than land tuners early on in the game, and they don't need as many consistency boosters to help find their key cards. In Legacy, this lets them play busted stacks cards, like Chalice of the Void, to slow down their opponent. It's hard to say exactly what the best build of the deck would be in Modern, but it's pretty plain to see that it would be a lot better than Tron is right now. Cloudpost was banned all the way back in 2011 because this kind of deck would have been way too strong for the metagame all the way back then. Could Cloudpost be unbanned? This is kind of a toss-up, but I'm going to go with a soft no. Tron isn't exactly problematic right now, so a better version of the deck existing wouldn't ruin the format. However, it would push the format more towards a combo off or die metagame. You see, due to being more difficult to interact with than Tron, and modern lacking key land interactions like Wasteland, slower decks in modern would basically have no way to win against these decks. They'd have to just hope they have an answer for every single threat the deck plays, as they wouldn't really be able to stop them from getting the mana they want, which is usually the strategy the decks employ against Tron. Modern is already a very fast metagame, where combo and aggro decks thrive, but control and slower midrange decks do exist, and pushing them out of the metagame the way Cloudpost likely would would be bad for the format. Not to mention, since it's better than Tron, you're basically forcing all the Tron players to build new decks without really adding anything to the format, which players generally don't like doing. In this kind of situation, Wizards usually chooses to do nothing, as taking action won't make things better, but can make them worse. How could Cloudpost be fixed to be unbanned? There's no way to put the card in a spot where it's playable, but not busted. Tron is already on a tight leash, as if the lands were much stronger, they'd be too good for the format. Cloudpost really needs to be either more consistent or add less mana. Making them add a mana for each other would nerf the deck too much, but it's the cleanest solution to the issue. Next up, we have Green Sun Zenith. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of X, meaning any amount of mana, and one green. It has the effect to search your library for a green creature with mana value of X or less and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle Green Sun Zenith into your library. This card was banned in September of 2011. Why was Green Sun Zenith banned? The issue was that this card was just too good at too many points in the game, and would have been such a staple that literally every green deck would play it. You see, Green Sun has a ton of great targets in basically every green deck. It can find good, efficient threats like Tarmogoyf, Scavenging Ooze, and Ice Fang Coatl. It can find specific hate cards like Godok Teague and Collector Oof in certain matchups. And it did all of this while not being that much less efficient than simply casting the spell from your hand, only costing one more green mana. This makes it far better for green decks than other similar tutors like Eladimar's Call or Court of Calling. However, the thing that makes this card unique when compared to these other creature tutors, and what makes it far more ubiquitous than these land tutors, the way the card interacts with Dryad Arbor. Arbor is a 1-1 forest forest dryad creature land. This means that you can play it from your hand like a land, and it can be tapped to add one green mana, but it's also a 1-1 creature. It's basically a Law Noir Elves that you can play as a land for a turn. However, it is also technically a green creature with a mana value of 0. This means that you can cast Zenith for 1 green mana, with X equaling 0 to tutor it out on turn 1. Which means that Zenith can basically just be a mana dork on turn 1, but be a tutor later on in the game. This is very unique amongst tutors. It makes Green Suns one of the best tutors all on its own. The combination of all of these things makes the card just too good for green decks, and Wizards ban the card to diversify green decks in modern. Can Green Suns Zenith be unbanned? This is a soft yes. It's very dependent on what you value in a format. The thing is, it would do what Wizards said it would, homogenize green decks. All green decks would almost certainly play the card, as the consistency provided is just too good. Now, whether a lot of decks playing a card would warrant a ban depends a lot on what the card is and how important it is for those decks. Right now in Modern, Lightning Bolt is one of the most played cards in the format, sitting at 41% usage in the metagame. Now, no one would argue that this means Bolt should be banned, because Bolt is just a staple that any red deck can use, not a main part of your strategy. However, Hogok reaching 40% of the metagame would be a lot more concerning to people, as it would mean 40% of decks were graveyard decks. Players and Wizards has a higher tolerance for cards seeing tons of play if they're supporting cards that aren't the main cards of the strategy, only banning them if they push the metagame towards those decks too much, and Green Suns really wouldn't make green decks too good, it would just make them better. Now, the question is how much you think Green Suns being a card that's played in every green deck is a problem. Do you think it's a card like Bolt that's just a supporting piece, or is it a centerpiece of a deck strategy like Hogok? Wizards does seem to think it's too format warping, and it would undoubtedly be a staple for run ban, but it could have some positive impacts in the format as well. And finally, we have Simeon Spirit Guide. This is a 2-2 Ape Spirit with a mana cost of 2 and 1 red with the ability where you can exile it from your hand to add 1 red mana. This card was banned in February of 2021. Why was Simeon Spirit Guide banned? Spirit Guide was used in a variety of different combo decks while it was in the format. 
The ability to power out combos that turn faster to make mana by simply drawing enough cards enables a lot of different combos that wouldn't be viable otherwise. The combo that got this card banned was T-Balt's Trickery Combo, which is another banned card we've talked about previously and won't go back into. It was also one of the best cards in Goblin Charbelter decks, which are decks that would run no lands so that Charbelter's ability would always deal lethal damage to your opponent. Cards like Spirit Guide that aren't lands that add mana are essential for the deck, and Spirit Guide was one of the best. However, it's not just these specific decks that got Simeon Spirit Guide banned. It was the fact that the card existing allowed tons of problematic combo decks to work. For example, there were several decks that were built around drawing their entire deck and then using Spirit Guide to make mana. One of these decks was the Ad Nauseam combo. This is a 5 mana instant that lets you reveal the top card of your deck and put it into your hand, then lose life equal to its mana value. And you can repeat this process any number of times. What the deck would do is cast Angel's Grace, a 1 mana instant that makes it so that you can't lose the game this turn, and then use Ad Nauseam to draw their whole deck. Since they can't lose the game this turn, the fact that this card would make them go below 0 life doesn't matter. Then they would exile Spirit Guides from their hand to make the mana for a spell like Lightning Storm, a very weird instant that deals X damage to any target, where X is 3 plus the number of charge counters on it. And while it's on the stack, any player can discard a land to put 2 charge counters on it and change its target. With your whole deck in your hand, you'd have enough lands to deal at least 20 damage and have more lands in your hand to make sure it ends up hitting your opponent. This is only one of many payoffs you could use with the deck. The reason that Simeon Spear Guide was a problem was that it was a card that made you mana for zero mana, allowing these kinds of combos to exist. Without cards like Spear Guide, all of these kinds of combo decks are made much worse, and drawing your whole deck isn't a guaranteed way to win. It turns out there are few ways to draw your entire library. Cards like Ad Nauseam and Grizzlebrand can draw your entire library pretty easily, and ways to get them out faster and more consistently will eventually get printed. Having a card like Simeon Spirit Guide in the format will make these decks problematic eventually, even if it isn't a problem right now. Could Simeon Spirit Guide be unbanned? This is a no. As I said, the existence of this card makes certain strategies not only better, but possible all on its own. Specifically, more all-in, extremely fast combo decks that win in one turn. Having any of these so-called fast mana cards, cards that cost no mana but produce mana, in the format allows these decks to exist, or will allow them to exist in the future. The issue is that Magic as a game, or at least formats of Magic where zero-man interactions like Force of Will aren't expected to be most decks, isn't capable of supporting these strategies. So Spirit Guide needs to remain banned more as a safety valve than because any deck it was played in was too good. How could Simeon Spirit Guide be fixed to be unbanned? The easiest fix is just giving the card any mana cost on its ability. Making it cost 1 red to activate and having it give you 2 red would make it do the same thing in terms of mana production, but wouldn't allow you to go from having 0 untapped lands to having mana, which is what is ultimately the problem with the card. Alright, and that's the video, and with that, the entire modern ban list.